All right. What's up, everybody? Hopefully this works. Um, I think I enabled uh, super chat here, so let's see if that works. Should work. I'm gonna send myself a dollar just to see if it works. <laughs> Oh, I have to add my credit card here. Wonderful. Nice to see everybody in the chat. Oh, guess I can't really do that live. Anyways, uh, I think Super Chat should be active. Um, and stickers, apparently. I'm just sort of getting used to that. The main reason why I wanted to enable Super Chat, uh, it's not because like we need money or anything. <laughs> I mean, it's it's great to get money, but that's not what it's about. It's because in some of the live streams that we do, it's uh, there are so many questions and comments and stuff that it it helps sort of filter it out. But obviously, I'm not gonna you know not answer a question, you know, just because somebody didn't you know like uh, use the super chat function, right? Like I'll answer whatever questions um, that we'll have in the uh, Q and A sessions. Um, but this just sort of helps filter out. Uh, filter some of them um and um yeah i uh, haven't really decided what we're going to do with the super chat earnings um if people even start to tip for that at all or pay for that um if that's something that you guys are interested in um you know by all means uh go ahead and i will answer any questions that you guys have but um what we're currently thinking about with that is um maybe this is something we can sort of loop into you know, trying to create a fund for, you know, getting different headphones that we might not be able to get otherwise. Because there's a lot of stuff like, you know, there's gaming headsets and, you know, there's head all kinds of headphones out there that people are interested in. But, you know, for whatever reason, I can't get my hands on one without just buying it, right? Which is which is fine uh, to do. <laughs> yeah, HU1. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't want to make it seem like we're going to sort of, you know, gate the content behind, you know, any sort of payment or anything like that. And same thing, I see a lot of people asking about, you know, how can we support the channel? How can we support what you're doing? And honestly, right now, like I've thought about, you know, starting up a Patreon or something like that. But for the same reason, I don't want to, you know, kind of block off any content uh, for you guys or any kind of any just any of the stuff that I'm producing. Um, so, you know, the best thing you guys can do right now, um, is to just, uh, subscribe to the channel or just, you know, leave a comment or, you know, uh, just, uh, yeah, basically stay engaged and, you know, uh, talk to us in the chat. That's basically the best way you guys can, uh, can support what we're doing. Um, but with that said, if you guys would like, um, to have, you know, a question answered, um, because sometimes we will miss them, um, we'll be sure to, you know, get every question um that somebody has uh, used the super chat function with <laughs> direct payments to Andrew l only yeah exactly no i i don't think uh i mean you know what it's like i mean youtube doesn't really give you any revenue so uh or very minimum mi minimal so um that's not that's not at all what this is about um honestly if youtube didn't have any revenue uh, i don't know how much we would really feel the difference so Paper money in the mail. <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to try and get going here with this live stream is uh, I'm going to try and do some EQ on the fly with the Gold Planar GL2000 here. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do this is because a lot of people have been asking me for my EQ profile for the Gold Planar GL2000, uh, double sided. And um, and also, like, I think the review that I did was a little bit controversial because there's a lot of people who, they probably bought the GL2000 from the hype and now they're like, wait, what? Somebody's saying it's not the greatest thing ever. So um, this is going to, I think, help, or at least the intention is to make it so that, you know, for folks who are interested in getting maybe a little bit more of a linear sound out of their GL2000, the goal with this is going to be to try and um, give you guys an equalizer APO profile to help with that. Um, and so... Again, if you guys are wondering what software I'm using to EQ, um, it is Equalizer APO with the PCUI. 
And um, so I'm going to be going through that and I'm going to be taking measurements of it as I'm doing the EQ so I know that I'm, you know, getting an appropriate uh, level there. Um, getting it, getting, yeah, you know, the appropriate adjustments. Because like a lot of what I'll do is like I'll listen first, then I'll measure and then I'll, you know, keep listening and do my EQ and then I'll measure it again and uh, see how close my EQ gets to the target. So a lot of it is a heuristic approach. It's a trial and error uh, type of thing. And I think I, I also need to kind of emphasize that like my evaluations do not um, require a strict adherence to the target whatsoever. I mean, the target is there as a reference point, a known reference point. I think a lot of people sort of get confused about that, um, that, you know, when they see, you know, a something like the Harman target and then you know they see how the headphone deviates and they go wait you know like you're basing your evaluation on adherence and deviation from the target um, but you know, realistically that's not the point of showing the target the point of showing the target is to show a known reference point um, and a headphone can sound totally good even though it may not you know match the target um, I do think though that there are some um, there's some consideration with that and it's that for all the information above 1K, most of that stuff has generally been figured out. And I don't think there's anywhere near as much debate about that than there is about all the stuff below 1K. Um, and that's sort of really where the question about you know the Harman contour and the base shelf come into play. And I actually think there is a difference for you know open back and close back. But for all the information yeah, above 1K, the idea of some ear gain being desirable, I think that's accurate, um, regardless of the person. I think no matter what, there needs to be some kind of ear gain. Um, so, you know, right around, uh, all the way up to the, sort of the, the, the top there at around 3K. <laughs> I see you guys talking about affiliate links. Yeah, actually, the affiliate link question is an interesting one. Um, I know a lot of it's sort of the the common practice these days um, to do sort of affiliate link um, you know YouTube reviews and stuff like that, um, but I actually really do think that like just because somebody uses affiliate links it does not necessarily mean that they are going to be dishonest. It just means that they have an incentive to potentially be dis be dishonest. Um, now I I don't use affiliate links personally um, because I don't even want to have to begin to deal with <laughs> that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I, I begrudge anybody for, for using affiliate links or that people who use affiliate links aren't trustworthy because the content itself should dictate what, um, you know, how trustworthy a person is, I think. Um, you know, there's all kinds of people who use affiliate links who are actually giving honest information. You see that in actually the, the camera, um, you know, uh, re YouTube review uh, section as well where you know there's lots of people who are being completely honest and transparent and they still use affiliate links and even stuff where they're like yeah this is terrible don't buy it <laughs> uh you know uh and then there's affiliate links there where you can get it if you want to so uh, i think it's uh yeah it, it it's one of those weird situations where there's an incentive and if you identify a little bit too much what's going on with the incentive or you you notice that a little bit too much then i think you can sort of over overcompensate and overcorrect for um, where people may, you know, not be as uh, trustworthy. But I do also think that there's way more people who are being less trustworthy <laughs> because of affiliate links. So, um, yeah, the incentive does count. Um, yeah, and also, like, actually, on the subject that I see you guys talking about the whole Z reviews uh, thing, I didn't do my GL2000 uh, review strictly in response to his video and actually I hadn't even seen his video until um, afterwards after I'd completed the review I'd only I, I, I did know that he had made one and I knew that other people were also really hype about it so I just knew that there was a general hype because a lot of people kept asking me about it in like you know comments and stuff and then people were even asking me on reddit about it because I did have it and it was showing up in the background for a lot of my videos so a lot of people were like hey what about the GL2000 you know so and so says this about it so-and-so says this about it. Um, and uh, so really it was more in a response to that. Um, I hadn't actually seen the video. So I watched, and I didn't watch all of it actually, I watched it afterwards, uh, at least parts of it. And um, and yeah, I, I, I think people sort of take that a little bit too um, seriously. Like uh, n not not that review, I just mean like the, the, the disagreement um, for a couple of reasons actually. The first I think is that because um well people can have different 
uh, preferences and different impressions. And you know, if you're expecting something in particular and you get something else, um, then you're bound to not be as, uh, I guess, enthusiastic about it. Whereas if you're not expecting anything, um, you know, and maybe you'll be more enthusiastic about it. So, I mean, I, I really do think there's a a preference element to this, but then I also think there's an expectation element. Um, and if you look at, like, if you rewatch my, my review on this, um, I actually did find things that were good about it. And I was uh, honestly, in the minds of some, a little bit too charitable as far as, you know, the analysis of the tuning goes. Um, but um, I think a lot of people, because I didn't say it was the greatest thing ever or hype it up to the same degree, um, you know, or said that maybe it wasn't, it wouldn't have been my choice at that price range. I think a lot of people sort of took that as like, oh, you know, he hates it and it's terrible. Um, but the reality is with the with the Geo 2000, at least, you know, in my opinion, it's that while, yeah, it isn't, it isn't the one that I would pick at that price. It's still like deserving of like, you know, hi-fi level, you know, sound accolade of some kind. It, Cause it is still, you know, it competes somewhat, you know, in that somewhere between 350 and, you know, $500, $600 or wherever it's at. So I don't think this is like, you know, <laughs> people, it seems like people really just want, you know, is it good? Is it bad? And I think that the truth is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, affiliate links are fine, are a fine line. I'm more okay with them if they're labeled really obviously when they're hidden. I'm not a fan. Yeah, there's that. But also I think, I think like the track record of the content should count for a lot because if, I mean, obviously like there's, there's situations where you can be like not relying on that incentive and like actively hedging against the incentive, um, for, for quite a while. And then eventually capitulate to it. I think that's totally a realistic situation, but at the same time, you should probably base judgment on trustworthiness on, uh, on a track record. So like a trend and, uh, you know, how, um, consistently, um, I guess, truthful the information is. Um, and it's worth scrutinizing. I mean, like people make mistakes too. That's the other, that's the other thing. It's like, I've been so wrong about stuff in the past. <laughs> um, like I even watch some of my old videos on my, you know, from my other channel and think, man, I didn't have anywhere near the like breadth of experience with stuff that I do now. And so my opinions then, and like, even just like knowing what to listen for has, has sort of changed and, and improved over time. And so, you know, my, my opinions back then, you know, if I had known what I know now, they probably would have been a little different. And in some case, a lot different. Um, I mean, if, if you're wondering what one of those headphones back there is, <laughs> if anybody knows what that is, you'll know, you'll know, uh, <laughs> that opinions can change. Um, and we should probably, I should probably at some point do a stream on, you know, headphones that I regret buying. <laughs> um, can you start reviewing DAX and amps so you can add a bit more insight into what ASR says versus other reviewers? Um, I can, and I, I do, but the problem is that he has, I mean, I shouldn't say that it's a problem. <laughs> it's a good thing that he has this, but he has the measurements on his side. He has the data on his side and sides is the wrong thing to, to, you know, use here because I, I don't think that when it comes to the measurements or the data that I would disagree. So I think a lot of that, it would require, um, getting the kind of systems that he has and being able to provide that same data. Um, cause really all I have to go on when it comes to amps and DAX and stuff like that is my subjective takes and then knowledge for how they, you know, uh, perform like as far as the specs goes and stuff like that and what synergies might work. Um, and then also using Amir's, you know, measurements on that, like the data that he provides is absolutely useful. I mean, again, this is another situation where I think people sort of put me like in one camp or the other, like, oh, he does, he uses measurements and relies on measurements. Therefore, he is an objectivist and totally agrees with, with what the objectivists are saying and disagrees with the subjectivists. And then there's other people who say, ah, he disagrees with Amir. Therefore, he's clearly a subjectivist. I think actually that last, you know, the latter of those is probably a little bit more true. <laughs> but, um, you know, realistically, I don't have any disagreement as far as like 
data is concerned. Like, I'm not going to go out and say Amir's doing it wrong. Like, I disagree about some of the methods that he's using. Like, I don't think you should base your measurement for headphones on one seating. I think you should try and get a number of seatings and make them be the most accurate you can, most realistic seatings you can. But one seating, I just don't think is enough. I think you need to do three or four. Um, and then also, I also really don't think that THD plus N, like I don't think that you know harmonic distortion, at least second harmonic distortion, is any indicator of lack of resolution. Um, which I, you know, so if disagreement exists, it's more so in terms of the analysis and in the conclusions and the valence uh, for for the reviews than the you know the data itself because you know Amy and I we actually use a compatible rig you don't use the same rig but it's it's one that's uh you know compatible like I think he uses the 45 CA and I use the um, 43 AG and the main advantage with his is that um, he has sort of like a, a consistent like over ear like you can basically put it on the rig and you don't need to mess around with like you know the different uh clamp um situations and stuff like that whereas with mine the easiest way to use it actually i'll just hold it up here so the easiest way to use this is with sort of like the the under the desk method where you put this on top of the desk and then you use sort of like a block underneath and then that's how you create the coupling here um but what i found is actually the more use or the more um realistic uh way of doing the measurements is to just use um one of these blocks um I actually have I've, I've got a few of them so depending on the clamp and it is a little bit variable as well. So the system that I'm running right now for my measurements is actually a little closer to what Crin does uh, with his mobile fixture. Um, and the idea here is to get it to be kind of the same uh, clamp pressure um, or, or you know distance um, uh, width-wise that you might find with a 45 CA anyways. Uh, but then as far as you know, the rest of the spec goes, yeah, they're both 711 couplers and... They both use, as far as I know, uh, they both use the same anthropometric, anthropometric ear, the KB5000 and 5001. So, um, so yeah, they should be compatible um, and comparable, just like mine and Crin's are as well. Um, actually, that's another thing that people didn't realize with the measurements. Um, that you know, for all the measurements that I'm posting in the videos, I am doing those measurements myself, um, and so. You know, I'm, I'm not pulling them from anywhere, or nobody's sort of, you know, nobody else is doing them. So a lot of the time, when I'm doing the measurements, what I'm looking for is actually um, agreement between what the graph shows and how I hear it. Um, now there is absolutely caveats to that, and I don't like. I was talking to Jude the other day about this, um, Jude from HeadFi. And by the way, anybody who you know has a certain opinion of Jude, um, he is not that person when you talk to him. Like he is the most knowledgeable person I've ever spoken to when it comes to measurement stuff. Um, totally the most, uh, you know, it, one of the most interesting people to talk to about this stuff um, and very passionate as well. Like, you know, um, so yeah, uh, I, I think it's worth people reevaluating their opinion of Jude. Um, and yeah, uh, for anybody who's got, you know, sort of a negative opinion of him, Jude is not head fi. Jude is a, a very interesting person to talk to. Um, You needed to pin a. Oh, they're so sad and outdated now. What is? I'm not sure what that's in reference to. See, this is why I need super chat. I'm actually not sure if it's working because I couldn't actually tip myself a dollar. <laughs> um, uh, who are the best YouTube headphone reviewers? Well, um, number one is Crin. <laughs> <laughs> he only has like a few videos so um just because i think crin's that re review of the review is hilarious um metal 571 is my is my favorite youtube reviewer but no i like you know dms and josh as well like dm dms's stuff's been getting a lot um he's gotten a lot and ever since he's gotten the the measurement rig there like his analyses are have been really really good i mean he's not using the same gross system that that uh that I'm using, he's using as Crin calls it the grass system, G R A S S, um, which is um, it. It gets closer than the ears rig. Let's put it that way, um, but you still need to run it compensated. Um, and so he and I have been sort of comparing measurements back and forth to try and get it so that his rig is like, you know, as accurate as a. Oh, it does work. Um, to, thank you, Scott. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, he and I have been trying to get it to be as accurate to what the actual gross rig shows. So, because like, the way I see it is like the more measurements that sort of are on the same standard, or you know, would the more me- measurement systems that are you know comparable and people doing measurements on that, the better for everybody. Uh, Burt reviews is another great one there. Yeah. Um, how's your Friday going? Uh, my Friday is going reasonably well. Uh, we'll see how this live stream goes. <laughs> um, so maybe ask me again at the end of the stream. <laughs> so far, I haven't had any technical difficulties. I'd like to be able to set it up so I can play music and like have people like say, hey, you know, try out this track on these headphones um, and then sort of give your impressions of how that track sounds on the headphones. But the problem is you can't really do that on YouTube without like whatever algorithm getting triggered. So I got to find a way to do that. So it's like just me listening, which I, I could do, but I'd have to sort of mute the microphone because especially for open back headphones, because it would come through and, you know, even if it's quiet, the, the YouTube algorithm will trigger it. Um, and it's not like I monetize these for any, like, I think it is monetized, obviously, but it's not like, like the only reason for that is because I think the whole channel is monetized. So it just automatically does that. So maybe this, maybe the answer is to just not monetize this and deal with the copyright strikes. I don't know. Um, I wish I could afford a team. I would hire DMS to shoot for me if I could, but the income I made from doing that was so tiny and by design on purpose. So I'm just reading Metal 571's comments. <laughs> I should read more people's comments. Imaging and soundstage is exaggerated in an unnatural way on the GL2000 to give the illusion of more detail, but compresses actual detail in the process. You know what's funny is I don't actually think that the GL2000 soundstage is all that crazy like i i think it has good depth like i'll um like to me there are sometimes tracks where you know certain instruments are very forward and then at other parts in the same song or in a different song you know you can hear instruments a little further away so if you think about the uh, um the sandara it's a much more sort of flat image all the way around like a like a two-dimensional image and with the gl2000 i do think you get a more three-dimensional image um, similar to the difference between the Ananda and the Aria. Um, but I, I also don't think that it is, in general, a particularly spacious sound like you might get with like a HD 800 S or an Aria, for example. Or actually, even the Ananda, I think, is a more spacious sound, but not as good um, depth there and layering. So that is one advantage of the GL2000 here, I think. Um, Bitter Buffalo sends, What? Is that an onion? Or is it an apple or a pear? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Uh, Krenn's YouTube channel is a gem yet. How is GL2000 for FPS gaming? Um, probably decent, actually, because, again, because it does have the depth. But I do want to stress that I agree with Chrono completely that dynamic driver headphones do a better job of even image distribution across the stage. So if you're wanting accuracy for your imaging and, like, for, for, for gaming and FPS and stuff, I would strongly recommend going with a dynamic driver headphone. There are some that are some planars that do work, I find, and that are sort of good exceptions to that. But typically with planars, I mean, I think one of the reasons for this is because with planars, the angle of the driver is like, is very much flat as well. So whereas with a lot of dynamics, the angle will be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason, um, I don't know if it's because of that specifically or other reasons in general i find that you know dynamic driver headphones do a better job of imaging um like a good example would be um actually the aeon 2 is a good example of of i mean it has very precise imaging but the overall like uh like center image like the front of the image is a very narrow uh point so when you hear a pan you'll hear pan like the instrument for example panning from left to right or left to right you got them backwards (laughs) you'll hear like pan 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 and then immediately cross over to the other side and then pan pan so whereas if you take a focal i don't know alex by contrast which is not a very spacious headphone at all but you take a focal alex the image distribution is far more even across the front of the stage it's a much more gradual presentation of the imaging so i kind of think the planers in general are not the way to go if you're looking for specific you know competitive fps play In my opinion, wait, in my opinion, are die Sundaras. Oh, is this in German? Are die, die Sundaras? <laughs> the boring sounding headphones for something like death metal, black metal, and grindcore. Man, 
listening to some Nile over here. <laughs> Metal knows what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I think... Um, so when it comes to genres, I, I kind of subscribe to the idea that, like, you know, headphones shouldn't be extremely different in general, regardless of the, of the genre. Like, I do think there is such thing as an optimal tuning. But... I do also find that I have preferences for certain types of headphones for different genres. So I'll give you an example. Um, and I mean in theory, because there's always going to be some recordings that are just very different. And certain tunings may do better with those specific recordings. But like in general, I don't think it's genre specific because you can have a wide range of recording styles within one genre. But um, as an example, I prefer to listen to electric guitars on tunings, headphones that have tunings that are a little bit more relaxed in the upper mids because it keeps them from being fatiguing, right? That as an example. Um, but the other thing I want to mention is uh, I do think for certain genres that have like a lot of really busy stuff going on, that planars are the way to go. So metal or, you know, rock where there's, you know, busy passages like double kick bass drums, that kind of stuff. Uh, I do think you want planars for that. Uh, because of the control that they are able to exhibit during busy passages. Um, whereas on dynamic driver headphones, they may do just as, go just as good a job at detail retrieval, except at the like, very high end. Um, but that's a little bit more well-suited to um, music that doesn't have quite as much stuff going on all at once. Um, and then also for, I think for metal and black metal and that kind of stuff, you want something that is, yeah, again, a little more relaxed because you don't want it to be fatiguing. And I also think having... So not going for a Harman tuned headphone is a good idea. You want it to be bassy, yes, but you don't want the uh, the contour there because a lot of that the, that music um, doesn't token the full sub bass frequency, like doesn't token the full frequency range down in the sub bass, and um, sort of the most bass that you'll ever get is sort of where that Harman dip is. So in the in the upper bass. So I think ignoring the Harman contour there is a good idea for metal. Um, all right, let's see. Let me, uh, I'm just going to switch it up here and get into actually EQing this headphone. Um, so let me just switch to the other scene here. I'm not sure if I'm going to show up. Maybe not. Uh, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Let me know if that obscures too much of the... Uh, <laughs> of the measurement system here. All right, so I'm gonna put the rig up here. I had to, um, if, anybody, if anybody's wondering why I'm not using the uh, RE20 uh, microphone, it's because I only have one interface and that interface needs to be used by the, uh, the Gross rig right now. <laughs> Otherwise it'd be really weird. So left and right, and we're good. So I now have the headphones on the rig here. Um, and I'm just going to take like a, a measurement here just to get a baseline. Um, I'll turn down the, uh, the audio here. I'll see if I can make this work. Um, this is calibrated at, uh, I calibrated at 94 dB, um, so it should work. But I'm actually going to, calibration doesn't matter for this because I'm not going to be worrying too much about distortion measurements. Um, I hope that's not too loud. gonna go negative six here and then go a little higher where are we here we are at a 5.48 something like that all right close enough Okay, so that was too loud. <laughs> um, take another one here. Uh, 
That's better. Okay, uh, question. Does the impedance of headphones correlate in part with the diameter of the wire or length of the wire used for the voice coil? It does have to do with the voice coil, um, but that is a question for Matt Economist, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't mean to be uh, calling him out for that um, mid-live stream, but um, yeah, uh, it, it is related to the voice coil. Um, actually, I think the, the guys from Aurora Saudi were talking about that recently as well. So uh, with this, I'm going to be... Um, uh, um, sorry, so to, to answer your question, yes, it is related to that. Um, but the variation and the ways and sort of the material stuff, uh, that is over my head right now. And I wouldn't want to, I mean, I could speculate, but I wouldn't want to, because like, you know, the different materials like copper and aluminum, for example, and I know this from the Focal stuff, where they switched to a solid copper voice coil um, versus a copper clad aluminum one, and one of the, and they actually went, actually went down in, in impedance. Um, and I, I kind of thought that was a little bit odd because it, you know, you'd think that aluminum is pretty light um, but then at the same time copper is apparently a better conductor so maybe that means they use less material um, these are questions that I just don't know the answer to <laughs> unfortunately but uh, thanks for uh, thanks for the question um, yeah okay so this is like uh, I'm gonna just adjust the target here and it's basically I'm gonna leave it uh, I'm gonna leave the um, the target right there and I'm gonna leave it uh, set on the this sort of more, more upright fixture here. So again, I'm not using the under the desk method for this. I'm using it coupled uh, to what is more of a realistic uh, situation, the way that it would be, you know, vertically on your head, like when you're when you're using it. Um, so um, if, let me start by EQing a little bit here. I'm going to start by EQing some of the bass. And um, so this is Equalizer APO. And I will adjust the preamplifying a little bit later on uh, once I'm sort of done with this and I see what the overall, you know, effects are. Um, but yeah, so looking at this right here, I want to add a bass shelf, but I also don't want to go too far. This is an open back headphone. So again, I don't, I think we can kind of ignore the Harman contour here a little bit. And I know that flies in the face of all of the sort of orthodoxy on, you know, resonances and CSD and stuff like that. But um, my recent, I guess, oops, what am I doing here? My recent fun with the Focal headphones has kind of led me to, or the closebacks has led me to sort of agree that it is desirable in closeback headphones. Um, let me know how the volume is, by the way, and how the microphone is. I don't want it to be clipping, but I can't always be checking the levels on this stuff. So this red thing adds a, adds a shelf there so that it's not just this 100 hertz that I'm adjusting here. So it does that, right? And we're trying to get it to sort of match that a little bit. Um, I'm gonna leave this. I think it's fine. I'm gonna try and turn down 100 or, or 1K roughly. Leave space, was it 139? Um, now, obviously um, using Roo here, I could uh, actually use Roo's EQ function and get like like a more accurate, I could use just regular equalizer APO and then input the values that I would get from the delta that shows up if you use uh, Roo's EQ function. I could do something like that, but the goal here isn't to get it to perfectly match the target with a million filters. The goal here is instead to use a few filters and then get it reasonably close and then show you what the what this curve here looks like so that you can apply it in Rune or whatever else you might be using for EQ. Um, because again, I, I'm of the impression that if you're going to, uh, or I'm of the opinion that if you're gonna be doing EQ, um, you know, use as few filters as possible um, and just to, just to make it easier, right? That's sort of the, the main goal. And you don't wanna be using super narrow values either, but with this one, we may need to get into some more narrow values um, in order to get it to sound right. Um, and also, like, if you're, if you're, like, I don't know, wondering um, about, like, the general assessment of this, I mentioned it in my review, but I think that the one of the things that people are kind of focusing on when they listen to this headphone, when they hear it, is the balance between this five five and a half K peak, I think it is, yeah, and 
you know, the sort of 12K and up stuff, the air stuff, um, because this stuff kind of really overshadows what's going on, um, you know, all the problems that exist for the rest of the tuning. Um, and so you don't notice those as much. And because of that, and this is, I said this in my review, because of that, it kind of works. The other thing that it's important to keep in mind with this is that um, there is some, I've seen some unit variation on these. Um, not like, so I've seen some unit variation in terms of measurements, but I've also seen some unit variation in terms of like the, the pads themselves. So like I'm using the default pads on here right now, but I saw a photo of somebody who had the perforate or the, yeah, the perforated hybrid pads that looked totally different. It was more of like a, kind of like a half moon shape on these pads than the sort of more oval thing that I have going on here. So I don't know if this is something that is perfectly representative after having seen those other pads. So I just, uh, yeah, I just think it's kind of interesting. I'll actually see if I can find that right now. Um, pardon my typing. <laughs> I'll let the chat go crazy for a minute here. Um, yeah. Here's the one that I want to show you guys, right? So like that, does this show up? That to me doesn't look like this sort of half moon kind of thing does not look like this, not really, right? Like, so I think, I think unit variation is also a likely culprit for this. Um, for, for why impressions differ on this one. But then also, um, let's see if I have here. So I have measurements here of the channel matching. I'm just doing right side right now, but you can see the channel matching is also not the greatest on this. I mean, it's not, it's not that bad. And I think I was having a conversation in the comments um, with someone about this, but I don't think that the channel matching here is as audible as it might look because it's only like a few dB out you know, in various different places. So, I mean, yes, it would, it, I think if you were really scrutinizing it, you could probably hear it, but this is the main part area where I think you would be noticing that. But okay, um, so we got the base done, <laughs> maybe. We'll, we'll measure it again afterwards and test to see what the difference is. Um, but yeah, is there any difference between using EQ in Rune as opposed to EQ APO? Well, the difference would be that in EQ APO, it's system-wide, but in Rune, it's just for what you're playing in Rune. I actually think that Rune's way of doing it is better. I think Rune is, like, Rune as an, as a, like a, a, I don't know what to call it, but basically as an audio player, uh, audio, audio player is better than everything else that I've used. Um, and, like, Rune with Kobas would be, like, ideal. Um, how different that is from Tile 320 or Spotify 320 is probably going to be dependent on the headphones that you're using. But um, but you know, obviously you'll hear a difference if you go up in headphones, even if you are using Spotify 320. But um, you know, I, I do think that the best digital music playback is Rune and and uh, Kobuz, which it sucks because Kobuz isn't available in Canada. So I'm really sad about that. But honestly, even, even Tile through Rune is better than Tile just through title um and it's yeah it's it's far better my only complaint with rune and their eq um and actually they did an update so i need to check that out um but yeah my only complaint is that rune is really there for exclusive mode so if you're gaming and you're you're you're, you're switching between you listening to music and watching youtube or any other sort of audio um content audio that, or content that has audio in it um you uh yeah, you got to wait for like 30 seconds and then and then play it, right? It's not seamless. Um, but also, I mean, they do have a non-exclusive mode, but it from what I, when I was using it, uh, like almost all the time, the non-exclusive mode is terrible. It, uh, again, unless they've changed it in an update, which I hope they will, but the, yeah, the non-exclusive mode, you hear the digital artifacts in there like crazy and it's awful. So really, Rune, with Rune, you want to use exclusive mode. Um why Kobuz over Tidal? Because Kobuz gives you the high-res files. Um, yeah, I know Tidal has uh, has MQA and all that stuff, but I don't I don't really get into that stuff all that much. It's uh, I think I think sort of the yeah the the questions around MQA have been mostly answered at this point, or have been mostly answered at this point. Um, I don't think there's a huge difference there. I mean, uh, the biggest difference with MQA stuff is in, in Tidal Masters is that the recordings themselves are very good. So um, I think there's a little bit of trickery going on there. 
Couldn't hear any audible difference between Cobas and Tidal through Rune. Tried blind test. Yeah, but you have a wider selection of high-res files with Cobas. That's all I'm saying. Um, so if you're in Canada, how can you get Cobas? I don't know. <laughs> that's that. Oh, how did I get Cobas? Aha, that's... I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but no, I don't have Cobas anymore, unfortunately. Just because I live in Canada. I got my flack over Bandcamp and play it through Fubar. Yeah, that works too. See, if you, so I used to get all of my uh, music with flack and I'd look for 24 bit stuff and whatever. Um, but it's just so inconvenient. So these days, these days I just use Tidal um, and I would use Kobas if I could, basically. Kobas really needs a wider music selection. Yes, they do, but for the content that they do have, it is, they have the high res stuff available, which is what I like. Um, no, not actually a VPN. No, um, it, it's another reason why, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, all right, let's 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 keep going here. So um, where are we at here? Yeah, 1039. Okay. Again, uh, this is just a ballpark as well, because this is not an average seating here. This is just one seating. So I'm just going based off that. And then I'm going to try, I'm listening to it afterwards and see how that goes. Um, and then we have to do a few adjustments here. Uh, I actually just want to reduce that by about two and a half and maybe make it uh, a little bit more narrow, actually. We'll see what two is for now and then we'll adjust that later. Um, and then the big thing here is this, what, 2.139. So, and that can be boosted by quite a bit. Let's see how that goes and then I will also make this at two we may have to boost something else in here because two is a little bit more on the narrow side but I don't want to influence this over emphasize this because as we'll see the whole range is going to get boosted right these are all depending on how wide your Q value is for this they all are sort of related to one another what am I doing actually I should do this over here just so it's easier um, I'll show you guys what I'm doing or as I'm doing it here um, so the next section to boost, I'm going to boost this 3.38 and I'm going to leave room 3.38, not that one, sorry, I'm going gonna... to leave room in between. Uh, oops, I got screwed that up, 3830. Um, I can leave room in between in case I do need to adjust this either up or down depending on what I do for the Q values here and how much I gain I apply. Um, and then um, you, it doesn't really matter, um, but it's just sort of for ease of like visually looking at it. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna boost this by maybe 4.5 for now. And again, go with two for the Q value. So if you're wondering what the Q value is, these numbers down here, that's how wide or how narrow the adjustment's going to be. So again, if I open this up here, so they compound one another, they affect one another. Um, so it's not just plus 6.5 at 2.139, it's plus, uh, well, in this case it might actually be, um, but you'll notice because they're far enough away from one another, but you'll notice that this section here, um, right at around 3K is also already boosted. So it's not like it's just boosting this and just boosting this, uh, right? So they do affect the frequency ranges around them. So we'll, we'll take a look at that afterwards as well. Um, and we may need to boost it more actually. So the big problem area with this headphone is the five point, let's say 5.33K peak. Did I miss any, any of the super chats? Um, I don't think so. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I answer all your questions if I can. Best without EQ, Sandara versus Alex versus GL2000. Uh, I like the Alex the best out of those. The Alex off of like a off of a tube amp, maybe a variable impedance tube amp. It was pretty fun. I liked it off that Cayenne uh, HA1A Mark II. Um, I didn't get a chance to try it off of the uh, amps that sound Kenzie, but I think that would work really well, um, like with a really nice tube amp, because uh, the Kenzie has a 32 ohm out, 
and I think the 80, what is it, 80 ohms for the Alex? I think that would actually synergize really well. You get a little bit of a base bump there maybe because um, the output impedance would be higher than 10, um, but it wouldn't be too much that it would be like overbearing. So I think that would actually work great. Um, I know that wasn't really your question. <laughs> um, Sundara, if you want a reference sound, the Sundara, at least the current pad revision Sundara is the most reference that I've ever heard. Um, you guys are talking about code buzz against versus title. <laughs> That's fun. Are you based in Ontario? No, I am not based in Ontario. I am based on the West Coast in Vancouver. Um, all right. So notice how this peak here is uh, it's pretty narrow. So I'm going to add a fairly narrow reduction here, and I may even need to go more narrow than this. So I'm going to start with four on that, uh, and I'm going to drop it by. 40 dB to start. We'll see what that does. Best daily driver under $2,000 for movies, video, and occasionally music. Why occasionally music? If you're just watching movies, I don't know if you need to spend $2,000 on a headphone. <laughs> An EQ to LCD2 or LCDX. <laughs> That's my answer. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you... So again, if it's mostly for music and depending on the music, again, uh, I would probably say something like a hi Man Aria or HD800S because those at that price are kind of the competitive ones. Also, the head audio headphone is a really interesting way of presenting stuff. But if it's watching movies, I wouldn't really recommend that because it's, it's quite heavy. So um, and yeah, I mean, you do get really interesting physicality for it and texture from the headphone. But um, yeah, I think it's too heavy for long movie sessions. Um, CMF Autour is probably great is great with everything. Yeah, it's Autour is my favorite tuning of all ZMF headphones. Um, even though I don't own it anymore, I sold it and I hate myself for it. I'm a terrible person. Um, if open slash close didn't matter, would you choose a Celesti or the Clear if it were on sale for nine hundred? Um, I think actually people kind of misunderstood that in the Celesti video, but in general, the open back counterparts are going to be better. Like open, unless it's like dramatically messed up and what something weird happened with from the manufacturer. Um, and, and there are counter examples where, you know, if the closed back ends up being better than the open back. Like I actually think the Verite closed is probably better than the Verite open, but um, even though again, I own the Verite open, but I think the Verite closed is the better one of the two. Um, so to answer that question, um, no, you, you'd want to, if it doesn't matter if open or closed, you'd want to go with the clear, um, because you like, again, the open doesn't have to have the same sort of issues, like the same, um, uh, compromises that, you know, closing off the back of the cup, uh, requires, you know, damping and stuff like that. Um, what do you think of the Sure 1540? Um, have not had a chance to review that yet. Same with the Allo S4X. Um, I did talk with DMS about that. I think that was the one. Do you know if Drops working on the Panda 2 or other wireless headphones? I do not know. I mean, I I, I assume that people are making new stuff. So <laughs> I mean, there's probably some idea of that kind of stuff in the work works, but I don't have any like inside track on on that. Um, okay, I'm gonna continue with this. Um, let me know if you guys if you guys have any questions on the EQ so far and what we're doing here. So the big thing here, um, and is, that I think is the biggest sort of criticism of this headphone, is that like the mid treble is just gone. Like you don't want to worry too much about the nine K stuff because there's supposed to be a dip there. That's just sort of the concha, and it might have shifted on this one because of the seating uh, to yeah eight point two K. That looks like it might be um, responsible, but um, everything here is just gone. So I'm gonna boost this by a fairly with a fairly wide well there's a couple ways to go about this one is to try and boost it with a bunch of narrow uh filters but i'm going to just try this going fairly wide um and let's just go with um 7.79 and if you're asking yourself why don't you just fill this in you could do that um and same with this but 
this isn't something I think is realistic for everybody. And where these dips show up can often depend on slight positional variances and seating differences when you're actually taking the measurement. And this is again why it is so essential to do multiple different seatings and multiple optimal seatings. Again, you don't want to be just going up, down, side, left, right, whatever. Like you want it to be the right seating every time or try and get it as close to be the right seating every time so that you get a much more representative average curve for positional variance. Um, okay, let's try that. Let's see how it goes up. I put it to 8K. Yeah, let's let's give it a shot at 8K. And again, I'm leaving room here in case I need to make more adjustments. And that is going to be what? Let's try 6.5 again. And um, I'm going to go 1.6 on this. Just looking at that. Because I don't want it to be so wide that it messes up 5.5K, which it might still. And I also don't want it to mess up uh, the upper treble because I think one of the things that we're going to try and keep intact with this headphone is the upper upper treble because I think that's what a lot of people sort of gravitate towards um, okay so now I'm going to actually uh, take a look before running the measurement again because it will screw up otherwise if I don't do this um, so this is the curve that gets applied right it's not these individual filters it's this because they relate they do compound with one another so let me just take a look at that again. So the highest that we have here is a plus five. So it's about plus eight or so dB plus nine. So we're going to go negative 10. And I'm going to need to, so I'm going to measure this now again, see what kind of changes we got. And I'm going to go negative 10. Oh, that's <laughs> that's why the uh, the first measurement was so much higher. I was like, what was going on? It's because I didn't I didn't add the negative six in in here. <laughs> let's uh, let's give it a shot. Why is that so quiet? Oh, <laughs> I went the opposite way. I'm supposed to go plus 10 on here. Okay, I'm just going to leave it at zero and then adjust it accordingly. That's better. All right. So let me just get this a little closer. Yeah, I know I'm adjusting the target. It's fine. So surprisingly, <laughs> we actually did really well <laughs> on our first attempt. <laughs> what do you think? If Metal Five Seven One still in the chat, he's gonna love this. <laughs> <It> was <laughs> this was literally just uh, just guesses, just my heuristic approach. And uh, we got it right <laughs> the first time. Um, I, so I still think we can be a little bit more more meticulous here. So I'm going to adjust this a little further down. Negative 4. I'm going to go negative 5.5 because I hate 5K stuff. Um, so I'm then I'm assuming that Concha... Uh, this is weird though. Like the Concha it should be here. It should be... This should be more of a dip. Um... But this could just be this seating. I don't want to adjust that. I don't want to change that now because we've been doing the seating the whole time. Although, actually, no, wait. I totally can change the seating. What am I talking about? Because, because we're, we are making an adjustment to the EQ, so it doesn't matter. We've already got the accurate measurement. Yeah, no, it's not really changing all that much depending on the seating. And that is like pretty common with these types of planars where they, you know, um, they're really large for the for the driver. So um, it doesn't really change that much depending on seating. Okay, so we have Concha interaction at 8.5, 8.4K. Um, let's just let's just hope that that works. Um, then, so the only weirdness here is that seven. 6.7k is 6.8k is like yeah there's a notch there um that's not that bad um that i mean you still get it'd be better if that weren't there and um let's try and fill it in let's try because like 
uh, let me just pull up the measurements of the Sundara here. Um, Sundara. See how the Sundara is actually perfectly smooth here? I mean, it's not actually perfectly smooth. If you look at the, this is obviously a smoothed average, but the uh, the different seedings are not, they don't have the same smoothing. So you can see they are actually a little bit more ragged there. Um, but, you know, it's filled in. So let's let's try. Let's do a narrow filter here. Um, where is that? 6.7. Mm, should we do 6.79? 6 something like that. And we will boost that by like, I'll tell you what we're, we'll do. We'll boost this by like five and we'll reduce this one to 4.5. And that way, again, see that's, that's compounded because I haven't, I haven't adjusted this enough yet. So this needs to be like five. And you see how that adjusted, right? So five might be too much. Let's go 4.5 for now. And yeah, maybe go a little higher on this one there. This gets, this is where this stuff gets really weird and I don't like going too much on this. Maybe a little, a little less here. So trying to accomplish more with less. <laughs> um, can you please explain what it means to compensate a graph? So, okay, so to compensate a graph, you would basically change the calibration. So these are raw graphs I'm doing here. Um, so a raw graph is showing what the actual frequency response is, right? If you wanted to see what a compensated graph would look like, um, then you would need to change the calibration to have some sort of uh, target curve in there. So a compensated graph assumes that the target that you're using is, is uh, is normal, right? And then so it normalizes it against that target. And for a compensated measurement, you want it to look like a flat line all the way across. And for a raw graph, you don't want it to look like a flat line. That's basically all you need to know about that. Um, okay. So let's give it another shot. This could be, this could also be worse, right? So we may want to revert change it that much so yeah not really worth doing I don't think um, let's try let's try going higher here lower here and let's narrow it up let's give that a shot um, actually maybe we can even just like go super low on that and let's knock it down well, a couple more here and boost it here. Uh, basically the compensated graph shows the error to the target. Yes, exactly. Um, this is something I wouldn't, I wouldn't adjust these when doing an actual measurement. And this is just for EQ where it doesn't matter, but ideally we would want all the measurements to be around what, like 85 dB, something like that. For distortion measurements, you want to crank it because you want to actually be able to see what the distortion is or what distortion features are. Um, and we'll, I'll examine distortion a little bit. So that's that does, uh, I mean, it did boost it a little bit, so it's just not enough. So let's see, maybe we do still keep, yeah, maybe we go 6.5 and we add that a little bit there. All right, let's give it a shot.
getting better. Getting better. I think we can even boost this more now. I'll also try and fix this here. That's just a very small little thing that I'm noticing. It's right around 375. Five, boost that by like one dB, 1.5 at most, and go 1.5 on the Q. Alright, we'll filled it in. Okay, now let's get rid of these. See, and this is what I'm saying is, you know, Harman has this sort of contour here, right? The, the, the dotted line. And I think for open back headphones, you can kind of ignore that, <laughs> right? You can go pretty much, well, you could go straight all the way down and maybe just have a little bit of bass emphasis, something like that. Or I, I don't know, like I do think it's nice if there's a little bit of, of flavor, you know, in, in terms of the contour here to help with sort of clarity and ensuring the bass doesn't bleed into the mids or anything like that. But you know, you could you could have it be straight across if you wanted to for more sort of richness and body. Uh, I agree with Crin on that, um, but some some a little bit of of, of a slope there is not undesirable. Uh, okay, so this is looking a little better. Um, let me just take that five point something down just a tad. Actually, uh, yeah, maybe just just one more point five. So negative six there. And all right, that's probably enough. So something like this, I think, would be fine. Um, Ah, uh, let's keep going. Let's do a little more. Let's do 4.4. So this would be this would be fine, but I think we can go. I think we can go further. I say 4.4. 4. Um, ignore the order that this is in. So if you're wondering why I did negative seven here, because I don't, it, it does, it's already at the target. The reason for that is because I'm boosting the ranges below it, and that's also going to boost this. So I'm kind of, I'm compensating for that small adjustment that I made there. I'm also going to boost eight again, and then I'm going to widen it, 0.8. Look at that. All right. We're in business. <laughs> so, oops. Didn't mean to show that. Uh, all right. So, here is the curve that I've ended up with. And this is the adjustment that I've made. So, what I'm going to do here is so we're, yeah. You have to go at least negative 10. So I'm at negative 13, but at least negative 10 on the pregain in order for this to work. Um, now, one of the concerns I think people are gonna have with this is what the distortion looks like before and after. Second harmonic is really not something that I think we need to worry about. Again, it's not a big deal. But um, here's the before and here's the after. And we're like, like, don't, this is, don't worry about the stuff below here. We're only really caring about what's going on up here. Um, and in both cases, I mean, it does change a little bit, but I think, yeah, not significant, does not change in any meaningful way. So I think we're fine actually on the distortion front. Um, really what we're looking for is like this kind of stuff. Um, does not, it seems to all be fairly okay as far as I can tell. So, 
So this is the, the profile that I'm going to post on the forum uh, for anybody wondering. And um, yeah, and this is what it looks like. Uh, now, of course, we don't know if what it's gonna sound like. So for people who don't like measurements, I'm gonna do some listening tests and see if this actually sounds good. And if it does sound good, then I'm gonna leave it at that. If it doesn't sound good, then I'm gonna make some more adjustments. Because that's really the goal here is to make it so that, you know, all the people who bought their gold planars, they can be happy and enjoy them as with a reference profile and then enjoy them with the sort of more flavored profile that they de by default have. Just, all right, just keep in mind that when you're doing this, there is potential for unit variation. And that may mean that, you know, your GL2000 double-sided doesn't, doesn't match mine and uh, then maybe it doesn't work with this EQ profile but uh, I'm going to give it a test uh, let me know like do you guys have any questions about the EQ um, feel free to ask questions I'm just gonna mute everything so that uh, the it doesn't like what I'm listening to doesn't leak <laughs> Eric Clapton Sorry, I forgot to I forgot to mute it there at the beginning, so maybe this will get a copyright strike. But it's okay. I I don't plan to have this video monetized or anything. Um, can you? Because yeah, then I it, it would not at all surprise me if there's a strike on that for just the tiny little bit. No, of course you can't hear it. I don't I don't want you guys to be able to. Hear it. I mean, I do want you guys to be able to hear it, but but uh, yeah, I, there are rules around that. <laughs> I'm not on a whitelist for being allowed to to do that. So I may have to do it with um, with um, very specific uh, recordings that I know I have a license to, because I do have some. Uh, maybe we'll do that in the future. Uh, going by the live stream with Grover Neville, do you think he was right that you should never boost in digital EQ and only make small cuts? Um, so no, I, I, I think... Um, I think there may be some truth to that um, theoretically, but I didn't push back on it on the stream because I just don't know enough, right? So like, this is something where I, I'm not as familiar as he is with the digital domain stuff. And um, and I think, you know, he's what he's talking about probably does have some basis in fact. Um, but as far as my experience with boosting, um, especially if you're boosting wide ranges, I haven't really had any issues with that. Um, I have had issues where it feels like the EQ is not properly taking with the headphone. <laughs> I've had those t types of issues. Um, but usually if you, with, well, a couple things on that. Usually with planars, it's not as big of a deal. I say usually because there are also exceptions to that. Um, but then there are also, uh, yeah, um, dynamic driver headphones that take EQ reasonably well. So um, in my experience, Planars are better for EQ, but 
and you can boost it and uh, like for example the odyssey planners i've never had any issues with boosting those they can take it like like a champ um but yeah i think functionally for the for the um digital domain stuff that he was talking about grover was talking about i don't know if i've yeah i don't know if i've ever really had that experience with with boosting stuff and any you know, issues um even if there may be some you know theoretical truth to that to what he was saying i just i'd, I'd love to learn more about that so that's why I, you know i'm interested in having another conversation with him about that stuff and same thing with the um same thing with the uh discussion on csd you know i i think there it's such an interesting conversation because there is an orthodoxy that says that this stuff isn't actually all that useful csd is not useful and then you have all the folks on sbaf saying that it is and showing it every time on their mini dsp ears rigs and i would have i was one of them i used to be an sbaffer right so like you know i was i had a i have a mini dsp ears rig over there i don't use it because it's not accurate and it's so much easier to use the gross but um yeah for csd i i can see the arguments from both sides and uh, i even spent long time long time talking with uh mad economist on the subject and um yeah it, it's it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> it's very complicated actually than i think people realize but at the moment i don't think we can base conclusions about i mean this is something i think even grover would agree with you know i don't think we can look at a data point and say that is necessarily the you know correlated with the experience the way we can with frequency response um, especially when doing regular sweeps and stuff like that um because yeah, I, I think even grover would agree that um you know you uh the measurements that we do have are crude as he put it <laughs> or we have a crude understanding of, of measurements um yeah not that the measure measurements are bad but that we have a crude understanding of them i guess that's fair uh how do eq with rme adi2 i'm not sure about if i'll be able to do that i don't have any i don't have an rme adi2 so if i did have one i would definitely get into that because it is interesting and I, I know the biggest barrier for a lot of people with eq is they don't like f futzing with software they just want to plug something into something and have it make music um or make sound right which i i, I get that and and I think there's like this worry that like once you start messing with software that you are taking away from the sort of like natural organic part of the experience. Um, but but re realistically, all of your music is digital anyway. <laughs> so like it's not really, um, I think that's more of like a psychoacoustic effect than anything else. Um, but uh, with that said, I mean, people not wanting to dive into software, I completely understand and um especially for people who use mac and a lot of people a lot of people in the audio or headphone world are mac enthusiasts right so and they're within that ecosystem which does it doesn't have as robust like it doesn't have equalizer apo right so you'd be relying on rune or something else um in which case if you are relying on rune use this right this is what you roughly apply just keep the scaling in mind um and then yeah you should be fine with the gl2000 as long as this is somewhat representative, right? There's always, pardon me, there's always a chance that there's a revision or something with maybe a different pads or there's variation, unit variation, and then yours won't be representative. Um, but yeah, if you're a Mac user and you want to get into EQ, the Army ADI2 may be the perfect answer to that. I think it'd be awesome. Um, is there a compiled list of all the EQ profiles you've made? N no, but there is a compiled list of all the EQ profiles Chrono has made. So generally, if I EQ a headphone, I'll try and put it in the forum thread there with the other impressions and the measurements and then also the profile. And I put it in the reviews that I write as well. Um, but there's no database for that. Um, but there will be. Um, I feel like you might not notice the problem with boosting unless you are using Summit 5 level products. I'm not sure. I know what you mean there because like it depends on the product like uh, the abyss stuff apparently doesn't take all that well to boosts in the base for example at least that's what i've been told i can't verify that um because my like with the diana Phi that i evaluated did not need a boost in the base um but it, it did respond totally fine to a cut in the treble which is what it did need so for mac you can use sound source instead of equalizer apo uh, that's great <laughs> Did not know that because I yeah I'm not a Mac user. Um, all right, guys, let's do more Q and A. So so basically the uh, the takeaway from this has been that it 
this is a much better sound than um, the default tuning here. Let me just actually do the comparison here and I'll get them lined up. Um, let me change that here. Whoops, did that. See, with stuff like this, like, I have no idea where to normalize it because <laughs> you can't normalize it 1K and you can't, I mean, maybe 300 hertz, but I'm just going to try and normalize for ear gain with this. So, and I'm going to get rid of the squeaky snare, right? So, I mean, for people who say, oh, measurements don't mean anything, like, I'm sorry, but they do. <laughs> um, and so what I recommend, I mean, if you if you own a gold planer GL2000, Here's what you can try, right? Take, so so you have to follow these steps specifically. Do this EQ, right? Get these values in there or this, depending on whether you use Rune or whatever else, right? Um, then make sure you're you're not having any pre-gain applied. Leave this at zero, okay? Then in your music, uh, go negative on digital volume, like, or not negative, but like go low on digital volume. That way you'll avoid the clipping here. Now, I know what Grover said, I think is also probably true about it's better to use your amplifier, but in this case, you're just testing your EQ. So when you're testing your EQ, when you have it set up like that, listen for a bit and then toggle toggle your EQ, right? Uh, and then see which one you prefer, if you prefer it before or after. Um, and this can give you a sense of basically how the Sundara sounds relative to this. Because I kind of, I basically just EQ'd this to the Sundara. I mean, very close to the Sundara. I mean, not like the bass is a little boosted on this one. Um, so the Sundara's bass is like, yeah, somewhere in between. But uh, for the mids and treble, I basically made it match pretty closely with the Sundara. Um, I left the air up here because I know people like that. And I think that's something that people are sort of gravitating to with this. They hear that extra air up in the 12K region. Um, and it's like, whoa, there's this like extra little sense of, you know, detail up there, but it's not actually detail. <laughs> but yeah, this actually sounds great. Like when I listen to this with this EQ applied, um, this is a, I think it's, it goes from being a flavored Sundara to a, yeah, a little bit more like the Ananda tuning. Um, the Ananda is a bit brighter than this still, but um, it, it totally uh, sounds, sounds good with this. So yeah, hopefully this is actually helpful to you guys. Um, but yeah, so then once you're done testing and making sure that you actually like it, um, or, you know, making sure that it's actually representative, like, because again, maybe your unit is not like this one, because not everybody has access to these measurement systems, right? So you, I, you know, <laughs> I'm extremely fortunate that I can do this. You're going to have to, you know, base it on like the eye test and then also listen as you're doing it. And if it sounds weird, you know, try and figure out where it sounds weird by adjusting different values and then make it kind of match what you want. Uh, but yeah, once you have it set and you know that you like it, then you reduce this by negative 11 or whatever it is, right? So I'm just gonna save this as GL2K uh, Feb 5th. All right, if you were on the East Coast, I would drop off my Army ADI2 deck for such a vid. Well, I'm sure I can get my hands on one. I just, yeah. It, I haven't been able to do it yet. Uh, but that would be the interesting thing to me about the Army ADI-2. Like, for me, DACs don't make a very big difference, especially if they're the off-the-shelf chips. Now, I have experienced some DACs that do make a big difference, but, you know, if it's the, the new ESS stuff, like you find in, like, the, the song code that I did a review on recently or the um, Matrix X Saber Pro that don't have intermodulation distortion issues, they sound great. So yeah, it sucks that a AKM factory burnt down and we're not gonna see AKM DAC or DAC chips for a while. Um, if people can implement the ESS, like an ES9038 Pro stuff well without IMD humps, then we're all in for a treat. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I haven't tried any of those like, you know, the um, NOS stuff or like the, you know, R2R resistor, resistor, ladder DAC stuff. I'd love to. Um, how are you, would you say the 43AG is from 10 to 20k so the 40 so okay the 43g um i should leave a link to an article that i've been reading recently about measurement systems but so the 43 ag the 45 ca and all of the there are many others are all they all are uh, what's called uh, well shortened to what's called 711 couplers so they are all in theory comparable with one another um, the only difference would be in terms of 
um, ease of use for starters, and then also clamp pressure. And I have noticed that there are still also some other differences uh, among the rigs and the results that you get, even though they're all on the same 711 standard. So, um, but um, in short, they are rated for accuracy up to 10K. They're not rated for accuracy above above 10K. Um, now, in my opinion, that doesn't matter that much because there's so much positional variance above 10K anyways that it doesn't, it doesn't really make a huge difference. Um, so like you may have, if you know, maybe in the future I'll get on a 5128 um, rig or something like that. I love to. Um, I think Jude's right about a lot of what he says about the 5128, um, or at least it's a very interesting conversation. Um, and uh, I've learned so much from talking to him about that and about and even about these 711 you know couplers because I mean that's <laughs> basically it's a, you know it's a conversation that I had where I learned how much I don't know, <laughs> which was which is fantastic to have. It's it's humbling in many ways, but. Um, you know, supposing I had an accurate 5128 uh, that's, or 5128 that's accurate above 10K as well, um, positional variance would still play a role. It would still be a factor. Um, and so you'd still need to average and whatnot. The only benefit to that is that it's it's going to be a better representation um, because it's actually going to be rated higher than 10K. Um, so, I mean, I think while this does tell us something, right? So like all the stuff above 10K, it tells us that there's energy there, right? But it's not perfectly accurate. It's not accurate or not rated for accuracy in this region the way that it is for the rest of the, the you know, the rig. Now, it, it doesn't mean that we can look at, we look at this and go, oh, it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. It just means that it matters less, <laughs> right? And some elevation here, like that's, that is representative, right? Same thing with this measurement. Oh yeah, no, I have it up. So it is representative that there is some, you know, boost to the air frequencies it's just not it's not representative the way that the rest of it is representative um all right i hope that answers your question <laughs> did zeos overhype it probably i need to finish watching the video um do you think upper mids and treble fr correlates to perceived imaging and staging yes absolutely so okay do you think upper mids and treble fr so like certain features about, like you can fake soundstage um, and imaging and sort of image depth and placement and stuff like that with, with um, you know, tuning, yeah, tuning trickery. Um, and specifically, you know, cutting certain things in the ear gain region and certain places can, can definitely enhance that. But once you, once you sort of like identify that as being a, a tuning weird, like a, some sort of tuning trickery, um, then um, you, it, the spell is, uh, yeah, is lost, is broken. <laughs> uh, I think actually the same thing happened with the Verite because the Verite has a cut here right at around like, uh, like th yeah, three k ish, um, and uh, I think that also contributes to the sense, the extra sense of soundstage that it has. Now it is also a reasonably spacious sounding headphone, even when you EQ that. But um, yeah. Uh, it, th there is a little bit of that element of like soundstage um, faking going on with that headphone too, which is, I think it's fine to do. It's just, I would prefer the tuning to be a little bit more like, let's say linear for what the brain expects to hear overall. Um, that's just my preference. I know some people prefer, you know, different types of flavor and tunings. So the army ADI2 does sound ideal for Andrew. Well, yes and no. Uh, yes. In the sense that it would be fun to use, but uh, no, in the sense that I'm perfectly happy to do it with software too. <laughs> so um, the the one downside with this though is that like EQ APO is way more precise than Rune is, even though I like Rune's EQ better. It just means that I need to create a profile in Rune for every headphone as well, and that's just like that's a, it, because it's a different process. It involves doing twice the work. You have to manually create this. Not twice the work, but you know what I mean, right? Like, it's just an additional step that you have to take because you have to manually create this in, in Rune. And then you can also be, like, not as accurate um, as a result. Um, let me just leave this up here for people who are, like, coming late to the stream and they're like, what did you do? <laughs> um, we've we fixed the gold planar deal 2000. <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts wait so what so would you buy it if you had six hundred dollars buy what the oh the gl2000 probably not um 
no i definitely wouldn't um it sounds good with this eq uh, that i've done but i also think that the limitation is still on the sort of hazy ish um mids um, which again makes it for detail it competes more with the sundara i think and so you know you're paying twice the money or almost twice the money for the gl2000 and i don't really think there's any advantage you know uh, or that much advantage as far as like yeah the advantage is like the depth capability right is that worth twice the money or almost twice the money over the sundara to you even if you do eq uh, i don't know about that um and it, it does have better dynamics than the Ananda, so that's good at least. Um, but I would probably end up just gravitating more towards an Alex, a Focal Alex. That would be my pick at around this this price range. Because um, I think the GL2000 is like like the double-sided one. I think it's like 630, 640. So I would just get an Alex. That would be my pick. I, if it works, like I know there's reports of them dying and breaking or whatever. So just be you know cognizant of that. Um, So, um, what are your thoughts on comparing headphone space, mostly on post EQ state, even if it's even if it isn't representative of an out of the box product? The concept of evaluating cans based purely off of technical. Yeah, so I think the most realistic eva the best evaluation of a headphone is the one that is also the most realistic. So, as an example. I would prefer it if I didn't have to EQ anything. I prefer it if I could just put the headphones on and, you know, listen off of whatever equipment I want and maybe, you know, sort of flavor it up with a tube app or something if I wanted to, that kind of stuff, or have, you know, output impedance change the, um, the FR. That'd be great. And actually, the Focal Utopia is exactly that headphone, <laughs> if anybody's wondering. Um, but there are also other headphones that are great for that as well. Uh, but I think realistically, if somebody's buying an Odyssey headphone, uh, for example, like the LCD 2F or LCD X or something like that, or LCD 4, uh, you know, kind of tacitly baked into that purchase is the recognition that these headphones are so technically impressive that you know, they can handle whatever EQ you want to throw at it. And so it is sort of a little bit baked into the concept there. And so I think because of that, because those headphones are so good at handling the EQ, I think an evaluation of those headphones with EQ actually makes a certain amount of sense because that is actually a realistic way. Uh, like it's a realistic, um, it's a representation of the way that the customer would be actually using the headphone, the way that the, the person who bought it would actually be using the headphone. So I do think that that's, that's fair. And this is actually where Crin and I depart a little bit. Like Crin is somebody who I trust. I trust, like, you know, we disagree on stuff, but I trust his opinion and his, his takes. And he's, he's very good at listening and he knows what to listen for. Um, but I think for him, he bases a lot of it on sort of more first impressions kind of stuff. And because of that, he doesn't really get the opportunity to do EQ with stuff as much. So, um, so yeah, like, um, I think for for some of the full size Odysseys, absolutely, I think uh, you know, evaluating them with with EQ in mind is totally fine, um, because that's that's one of the fun aspects about those headphones is that like they are so competitive for their technical performance. Um, care, okay, let me. I, I'm I'm missing a few here. Sorry, guys. If you guys want, if you really want your question to be answered, um, hit me up with the super chat. Um, not because I need money, but because I there's a good chance I'll just miss it. I won't be able to see it. Um, what do you think of EQ by ear with sign sweeps? I'll try and get I'll I'll try and get to it anyways. So <laughs> don't think I'm holding any of it hostage. Um, yeah, EQ by ear with sign sweeps is the way that I used to do it before. Well, not sign sweeps. I would. So Metal 571 kind of put me onto this method, but you, if you take a, t like a, yeah, basically if you if you use a parametric EQ with a notch filter, you can find out where um, the sort of dips and peaks are in a headphone. Um, but that, it does take a little bit of a setup to do. So I used to do that method. Um, and you just b basically drag the notch, you know, to whichever part that you want. Um, but that's a little, maybe a little bit more complicated than what people want to do. I think, there's a risk when using sign sweeps that you're going to mess up the EQ uh, for 
Um, not the headphones have like overall like adherence to any sort of target or anything like that, but um, I think uh, there's a risk that you can mess it up because uh, because of our own hearing. And so what you may mess up is the balance between fundamental and harmonic when you do that. So I, if you're just getting into EQ and you're like you're not interested in doing um, like a preset and you want to do it yourself, which I highly encourage, I do think it's worth doing by ear. But I also think it's worth using like 10 test tracks that you know are well recorded um, and you know you play music while you're doing your EQ and see what happens and I think that's sort of the best way to start um, but also use measure like industry standard measurements that are done on this kind of systems like the Gross 43 AG um, they are again really good tools for getting into EQ and so see where the headphones like again don't base it on adherence to the target I didn't make it perfectly match the target here but I got it reasonably close and you know basically try and try and get it so that you know it, it gets also reasonably close um, or, or you know retains whatever balance for fundamental and harmonic here so if you think about it like fundamental tones are often down here and then your harmonics and resonant harmonics are usually up here depending on the instrument that's being uh, played or the tone that's being tokened this is also one of the reasons why I think it's so critical to and maybe this is going to be controversial but I really think it's better to do EQ um, and evaluate tonal balance with music that has instruments or vocals. Uh, vocals are actually, that's the probably one of the best uh, indicators, one of the best ways to do it, and a wide range of vocal recordings because everybody knows what vocals are supposed to sound like. I know that a lot of people like electronic music and it's fine. I'm not saying you shouldn't like, you know, like whatever you like, right? But the problem with EQing stuff um, when and using electronic music as your like reference is that electronic music are gen it's all fundamentals right there, electronic music is just generated tones so there's literally no um, there's no harmonics for that it's all pure tones so um, so that the, so the problem is that you don't know what the balance is like for fundamental and harmonic um, and uh, that means that it won't matter what you EQ it to. <laughs> <laughs> right i mean you may just eq it for bass and treble and that might be all you do with electronic music but because so again let me just kind of back up here if you take an acoustic guitar tone right and you hit the string and acoustic guitar there is a the, there's the the primary tone part like the main sort of sound part tonal focus thing and that's the fundamental it's usually the lower the lowest part um, and this is all this is a really deep subject it's worth googling <laughs> getting into um because this is all math essentially but um but so that fundamental tone uh, has resonant harmonics that exist, you know, in, in frequency ranges above that for quite a quite a while. Like it's a very let me see if I can actually find the chart for this. Um, but basically, yeah, you want to make sure that the resonant harmonics are all in balance with one another. And when you're listening to electronic music generated tones, you th there's no base there's no baseline for that because that stuff doesn't exist in in the real world. It doesn't have those resonant tones. Uh, resonant uh, harmonic overtones and stuff like that. And I'll find the chart here. Um, it's basically used for mixing and mastering, um, but it's a, it's like an EQ cheat sheet here. This is the one from Lander that I've, I've been using. It may not actually be perfectly accurate, um, but this is the one that they use. And this just gives you an idea of, uh, of that. So I'm not sure if you guys can fully see this, but um, let's see. A guitar right so these are your fundamental tones here for guitar so anywhere from 50 hertz well 60 hertz up to um 1.3 k hertz yeah 1.3 k hertz hope metal's watching for that uh, and then you got resonant harmonics above that right uh, pianos are really weird piano because let's see yeah that was guitar pipe organ nice yeah so so electronic music it's all fundamentals right so, so it doesn't matter what the balance is for electronic music because it's all fundamentals <laughs> um now you may want to it, it may still matter as far as preference is concerned but for accuracy it doesn't really matter because there is no baseline um i don't why do i not see piano on here maybe i'm blind got, oh there it is piano yeah so piano is weird because uh, so if you hit like a really low note on a piano, um, it's going to have a different harmonic prop. I mean, it's the same for everything, right? But the range is pretty pretty significant for fundamental tones and pianos. Um, so, and actually, the interesting one here is cymbals as well. So, so you know, you hear a cymbal and you think treble, right? It's true. 
because the resonant harmonics are it, it's dominated by like the type of sound that a cymbal hit is it's dominated by resonant harmonics whereas the fundamentals are like the actual tone is is way lower than people think anyways that's that <laughs> um and it is worth diving into that subject at some point um, because it is very interesting um pa -pa -pa. Um, okay. Let's see a bunch of retracted messages. I don't know what's going on there. Oh, uh, yeah, you can just watch it afterwards, David, Joshua. Um, yeah, Alex QC issues. I know it's an issue. I, I n I've never had any problems with that. Like, people talk about the Focal drivers clipping, and they talk about the... Um, they talk about like the failure rates and stuff on the Alex. Never had any issues. I've owned full Cal headphones. I've never had any of those issues. Um, I will actually be doing a video pretty soon on the Focal driver clipping issue um, because I think what people are missing from there was that article from ASR about like the driver clipping in the bass when you get it to match the Harman target. For starters, I think that's dumb. I think um, getting a fo like EQing a Focal clear to perfectly match the 2018 Harman shelf. It's just like, I, like you could try and do that, sure, but I don't know why, like, it's not needed. The base, I mean, the base, as I mentioned, all the stuff below 1K for uh, for frequency response is basically preference. Or maybe not 1K, maybe a little lower, like 700, 800 hertz. Everything below that, it's all basically preference um, and expectation based. And all the information above that is based on your physical ear. So what your physical ear is doing and amplifying. Um, so getting you know target adherence above 900 hertz or 800 hertz wherever it is um you know for the pinna the concha in the ear canal and the eardrum that makes sense and i do think it's some sort of ear gain is desirable so that's been basically figured out um and all the rest of the stuff below that um it's not as critical to get that perfect it's more of just a you know uh base energy and level preference thing um, not a not a you know making something sound uh, acceptable or terrible <laughs> right so something can just be base light but still be agreeable for the rest of its its frequency response um, so yeah I'll do a a uh, video at some point on the focal clipping thing to see what the actual volume is uh, for when those start to clip um, and what the base level ends up being both with EQ and without EQ, because I think that's important um, for people who may want to do EQ. Because, I mean, it's well documented that that guy listens to stuff that's way, like his music is, his music I think is mostly classical, so that it's less of a problem. But um, what he was showing there in the tests was not realistic, not a realistic representation of what people would be listening, like the volume people would be listening to, it shouldn't be. Um, and I know, I think he was, I think he was also calibrated for bass, uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but but I think he was yeah not calibrated at at uh, it wasn't based on a 1k um, sample. So um, yeah, I'll probably do something like that. Um, one other thing to note, like so, I'm SPL calibrated with this thing here, and I think that's actually what most people use for for doing this kind of stuff. Um, and so um, I only recently started doing this, but this will help with getting that to be accurate to show exactly what the volume is. Um, but the, the other thing to keep in mind as well is that like if something is, and I'll note this in the video, but if something is calibrated at like, uh, well, say your your tone that you're generating, it, you're calibrated at like 85 dB, that's actually bad for your hearing over a certain period of time, right? Just listening to music at that, at that volume level. But realistically, when you're listening to music, it's never at the level that your test tone is playing at. So your volume may be at 85 dB when generating a test tone, but the music that you're listening to can vary significantly. It can be quite a bit quieter. In most cases, it's quieter than that by about 5 dB, 6 dB. Um, so, and again, it really just depends on the music that you're listening to there. Some can be, I've, I've listened to some stuff that's actually very close. <laughs> uh, but um, so yeah, just keep that in mind that usually the where the point of clipping may actually be from the test tone is not going to be you know where it would be for 
um, for music, right? So the test tone is not representative for clipping in the music. Um, Have you taken one of Oratory's Harmon profiles and see how closely it measures the target on your setup? Uh, they should be identical, actually. Because well, they shouldn't be identical because I don't. Uh, he is way more spe like specific about his EQ profiles and uses like I don't even know if he uses um, EQ APO to do it. I think well, yeah, I think he uses EQ APO, but I don't know if he uses piece. So um, yeah, I should actually ask him what if he's changed his method at all um, in the last little bit. I know um, Jaco Passan and changed his in auto EQ uh, because he was a bit concerned about uh, certain certain issues. I, I didn't read the full thread, but um, I think he's changed the, the entire methodology for auto EQ. Um, but one of the things that I like about Oratory's uh, stuff is that he does factor into his, his uh, EQs the fact that there should be a 9K dip or some somewhere around there that there should be a dip. And um, so he doesn't EQ that, he doesn't add that into his EQ profiles. And so, you know, you could get it to match the target, but it would sound worse. Um, and uh, so that's what I really like about his is that he does factor that in. So I'd say, yeah, if you're gonna be basing, if you're gonna be using like a automatically generated or like a profile from somebody, um, and you're not gonna be trying to do this yourself, um, you know, use, uh, I do recommend using oratories. Um, he, that's probably what the ones that I would use. Um, the main reason why I'm doing this is so that you can do one, you can, you can do it yourself and you can kind of, you know, understand this a little bit better. Um, but then also, I mean, if you do want to just input these values, the main benefit of this is, is that you can apply this, this curve here, right? So, I mean, you can do all this stuff with EQ APO, or maybe you can even, so with the PCUI, or you can actually go into EQ APO and do it manually that way if you wanted to and be even more precise and more specific, which is I imagine what oratory does. Um, but that's a lot of work. <laughs> so so unless you're grabbing a profile directly from him. So really the point of this is to use very few filters and then, or as few filters as possible, and then apply, you know get, some, get the curve and then be able to apply this in whatever EQ software you have that you're using whether you're using an army ADI 2, whether you're using Rune, or whether you're using this, um, or another so piece of software, right? So that's kind of, it's it's mainly there as a guide. Sundara or LCD X, I canceled my GL 2000s. Uh, LCD X is crazy detailed, but I think it can benefit from EQ, or well, it requires EQ, but um, yeah, there's actually, that's a tough question because they're in very different price brackets. <laughs> uh, if you want something that's reference sound, go with the Sundara. If you want something that's technically astounding, <laughs> go with the LCD X. Um, what is your beard care routine? I use a comb. <laughs> I actually do have, I, I used to have some beard oil that I would use. Um, I need to get some new stuff, um, but it, it, I really liked it. Um, made it very, very smooth, um, but I ran out. So I haven't been doing that anymore. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the uh, super chat there. Uh, I'm sorry if I've missed your question. That's what I'm talking about. I, I have trouble getting through everything. Um, I'll go for another 15 minutes, try and answer as many as I can here. Um, yeah, which tube amp would you recommend as your favorite? Uh, I really like this Amps and Sound Kenzie, but I also like the ZMF Pendant. I think with tube amps, the big question is going to be what headphones do you have and what's going to be have the best pairing and synergy. Um, and with that, I mean both the type of sound that you want and then also the um, the output impedance um, of the various different outputs that you have. Um, so as an example, the Kenzie here is not what I would use for a inefficient planar magnetic headphone. Not at all, because the Kenzie... Um, it's I got enough power to drive like 90% of headphones, probably even more than that. Um, but there, but it doesn't have enough power to drive the, like the HE6, for example, or, you know, LCD4, I wouldn't run it off of that. Um, honestly, the, even the Sundara, I probably wouldn't run off of that because uh, the Sundara does take, uh, you know, a, a decent amount of power there. Um, if anybody was wondering like, oh, it's low impedance. How does it, why does it take lots of power? Look at the sensitivity. That'll tell you. <laughs> um, it's not just about impedance, 
But um, I, I wanted to mention that the Kenzie here is 32 ohm and 300 ohm for the outputs. So if you have a headphone like one of the Focal Closebacks, um, it's actually not a good pairing because, well, it's not a good pairing by default because the, fo the Focal Closebacks are all uh, 35 ohm, I believe. And so you're basically matching the output impedance of the amp with the headphones. And so you're going to get a bit of noise floor there. Now, what I did, and, and you're also going to change the frequency response because the Focal headphones have an impedance bump somewhere in the base. And so you, it like they're already boosted at like one at 100 hertz. And it, it boosts it by about like three or four dB when you use it off of the high output impedance source. Um, and the same thing with using a solid state amplifier, right? It doesn't need to be a tube amp or whatever. Um, but what I found was interesting is I just used this impedance adapter and it completely got rid of the noise floor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I ran this impedance adapter with the Focal Celesti and the Stelia just now. Um, and uh, and yeah, com noise floor completely gone. And um, and uh, it also boosted the bass even more. Now on those headphones, I don't think it's desirable. So I just EQ'd it down uh, even more than I normally do. So um, I think it's one of those you know uh, trade-off issues. Um, uh, I personally wouldn't recommend that amp for the Focal Closebacks. But... For the open max, for the clear, the Allure, the Alex, and the Utopia, I think uh, that I think the Kenzie is basically perfect. That's exactly the amplifier that you would want. Um, now, the difference between the Kenzie and the Pendant, I'll get into this in my review of the Kenzie, but in short, the Pendant is more about like depth and texture, whereas the uh, Kenzie is more about uh, that sort of euphony and sweetness and richness of tone. These are totally subjective nonsense audiophile terms, but that that's really the best way I can describe it. Um, and so for the tone, I love the Kenzie and what it does. Basically, every headphone that it has a good synergy with, which is again most headphones, it just it's just magic. Like it's to the point like people think, oh, tube amps, less detail but more you know added distortion, dirty. No, that's not what that's not what's going on with this amp. It's actually perfectly neutral, unless you have some sort of weird impedance changes going on with the headphones that you're using. If they're low impedance, then it might change it. But um, dead neutral uh, does not introduce any additional, like not no obvious additional uh, second harmonic or third harmonic. Like I was, I need to actually investigate that a little bit more because I don't have the tools to measure the amplifiers to measure the amplifier specifically for like Synod and stuff like that. But as far as the headphone and the FR and all that stuff, it did not change anything between that and the and the uh, Fonder X and any of my other solid state amplifiers. So, um, so that was kind of shocking. Uh, but then, um, yeah, um, I think, uh, f yeah, depending on the headphone, for for most headphones, uh, something like the Kenzie would probably be my pick uh, for my favorite tube amp. Uh, let's see. Has the new Celesti had an EQ profile? Uh, no, I didn't make one yet. Um, I also don't know if it really needs one. I, if I were to do anything, I would um, I'd use a fairly... Uh, I mean, I do have one made myself, but I, it's not finished. Um, but yeah, if I were to do anything, I would drop like 120 hertz by maybe like 2 or 3 dB. Um, that's, that's, and maybe like boost boost the sub bass, something like that. Cause I prefer bass to be a little bit more in the sub bass than in the upper bass or mid bass. Um, it's not in the upper bass on that one. It's more in the mid bass. Um, okay. Does the clear have a better, bigger sound stage than the Alex? No, not really. Um, yep, yeah, they're both, neither, neither of them are about sound stage. If you want sound stage, HD 100S. That's really the way to go. Or, I mean, there there are good soundstage headphones that are more budget as well. Like the Harmonic Dyne stuff actually has good soundstage. Um, and so did the, some of the Bayer Dynamics are pretty good for that as well. Although I would never, I would not <laughs> buy that uh, personally. Um, follow up to the tube question. I have Aria HD100S Stelia HD6XX. Oh, for those headphones the yeah um amps and sound kenzie is fantastic for that i mean uh, the, you know i'm not saying you have to go with that um there are other amps that are great but that class of amps <laughs> i think that's a set amp, single ended trial um but yeah i'll need to do more research on that um but those types of amps are really good i mean i actually 
so out of those that I've tried, I've tried the six, well, 650 Stelia and the Aria. I don't have the HD100S here, but um, they all work great on on that amp. Um, again, I, it's not for really inefficient planars. It's for moderately efficient plan, moderately efficient planars, and then just about every dynamic driver headphone um, you can think of, and you get more benefit out of it with high impedance dynamic driver headphones. Um, yeah, but also depending on the sensitivity, there's going to be some. There's obviously going to be some exception out there. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a sort of kind of extra presence to the tone that I really like about that. Um, so whether it's the Amps and Sound Kenzie or the Mogwai or the Pendant, you know, or um, I mean, th th that's the thing. Like there are all these other tube amps out there that are more budget. Like even this one, that this is only like seven hundred dollars for the Kine HA One A Mark II, and and they're fine, right? But the big where you start to get into the real big differences and the note and the, the differences that really matter, in my opinion. It's with it's with this class, the Kenzie, um, the and uh, you know the set amps and like some OTL amps like the Glen OTL as well. Um, but I'm also, I mean, this is the thing. Like, I am loving getting into the tube world more and more. Um, it's it's ridiculously expensive, and there's obviously inconvenience of noise floor, and um, and you know RF RFI issues and stuff like that. Um, but I think that you know. If that's the price you have to pay to get the kind of sound that you get from them, it's still worth it. Um, and I have some solutions. I'll talk about it in my, my video on the Kenzie, but I have some solutions for how to help with um, some of the noise floor issues <laughs> or RFI issues um, with tube amps. Um, and with noise floor, um, I actually had a guy send me, it's it's called, uh, basically it's, it's a balanced uh, power conditioner, balanced something like something like balanced power conditioner i think it's called and it's called an equicore and basically if you have like shitty wiring in your house which i definitely do like if i if i turn on the blender the lights flicker right <laughs> um if if i yeah uh, and just all kinds of stuff wiring in the house is not good then the balanced power conditioner um actually does help get rid of noise floor because you hear your, your amp your tube amp will pick up the noise floor um, potentially, if you have bad wiring, um, and um, and yeah, so there's a few things that you can do. One is you get a balanced power conditioner, and they don't have to be these like Equicore. Actually, I think is expensive, but you don't have to get an expensive one as long as it's a balanced power conditioner. It it's huge. It's a massive transformer, and I I don't know if this is something I'd say everybody needs to get. I don't think that's true because for most people, you probably don't have issues with your building's power, but. Um, it definitely helped with the noise floor on this with this setup specifically in my apartment. Um, other ways of improving that um, are, I'm told at least, and I don't, I haven't I haven't A B tested this, but I'm told that other ways of, of improving that are um, with um, shielded interconnects, and again, not expensive interconnects. <laughs> um, I think you can buy fairly inexpensive shielded interconnects, and that should be all you need. Um, but you know, there's other stuff too. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to use, say, say you have like a DAC and you plug it, you're plugging it into your, your computer, right? Like say you have a desktop computer, you, your DAC is plugged in, right? If you're running it single ended, there are, there are a number of amps where, um, you'll, you'll hear noise floor there. Um, and weird sort of like, you'll pick up weird stuff going on with your computer. Like it's not desirable at all. It's, it's really intrusive. The way you get around that is by running balanced. Um, and, um, so yeah, if you have issues with that, well, two, two solutions, one is to go with, um, toss link or optical instead of USB because USB is not like USB controllers are often not very good. Um, and, uh, and you can pick up all kinds of weird noise from your computer. Whereas with optical, it sort of bypasses that. Um, but then yeah, the real solution there is to just run balanced, find some balanced setup. And that is one of the. I guess one of the leading advantages of, of going balanced over single ended. Um, and lastly, yeah, with the tube amps, I'm also told that one of the benefit, one of the ways that you can help get lower or lower the noise floor is by running a preamp with it, which is what I'm actually doing right now. And it, that was what made the biggest difference. I'm actually using the Fonitor X as the preamp. <laughs> uh, so that, and running it balanced as well. So that was the, yeah, that really helped. Um, A well-powered HE6 or well-powered LCDX. I need to get an HE6 in. I don't because there's also the HE6 SE. So I'm sorry, I can't really answer that question because um, yeah, I've not tried them side by side. Um, I 
I'd, whew, that's tough. I don't know. I think they'd probably be pretty close for detail, but uh, I want to prob- I want to give the dynamics edge to the HE6 from when I heard it, which was like years ago now. Um, does the gold planner really need an amp with at least two watts of p- output power? Uh, their site recommends so. I don't know. Two watts is a lot of power. Um, I, so I've been running it on amps that have way more power than that, just for reference. Like the Kyan IHA6 is seven watts a channel, and it's also meant for planers. So for inefficient, like this runs the HE6 and the Susvara and all those. Um, I don't, I really don't know if you need to have two watts a channel, like two watts for, for the gold planer GL2000. I should double check this actually, but I actually found, I actually think that the uh, Sundara took more power than the. <laughs> <laughs> the GL2000. Um, so I don't know. Um, Sundara weirdly does take a lot of power. Uh, let's see. What's up, Tyler? Just get. I'm 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 behind on the chat here. <laughs> yeah. So you wouldn't run the HE6SE off the Kenzie. It's very amp picky. But the Aria and the Radiance, you could run it off of the Kenzie. The the I would the radiance would not be good off the Kenzie because again that same issue of output impedance changing the frequency response in the base of the headphones and um, and not in a good place like it, it changes it around it boosts it by yeah maybe three dB at around um, like 150 120 hertz which is where the radiance already has its primary base bump so it yeah I don't think that would be you could EQ it you could do that and then EQ it and I've been doing that actually and it works great. And you can, if you have noise floor issues, then you use the impedance adapter. But if you're not interested in tinkering at all, I don't know if I'd recommend it for the Radiance. But for the Aria, it, it's totally fine. Um, and um, and no noise floor issues with the Aria. Perfect. And then, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think. What else? Uh, ZMF Verite on the Kenzie. Um, I love the tone that it gives you. Um, but with the high impedance out, which is where the 300, uh, it's basically that's where the more desirable power output would be for the uh, for the ZMF Verite. You do get just the tiniest little hint of noise floor there, uh, which is one of the reasons why I was trying to you know do what I can do I, do what I can can do to sort of eliminate that um, with you know balanced power conditioners and whatever else. Um, and while it did help, it didn't completely eliminate it. So um, I think I, yeah, I, I don't know if the Kenzie is necessarily the best for the Verite. I think that might still be the Glen OTL or one of the Felix audio amps or even the pendant. Uh, I know the pendant SE just came out recently. So that that's interesting. Um, I mean, at least the pendant is good for his headphones, of course, (laughs) Um, which makes sense. Um, Let's see. Your go-to choice for a sub six hundred dollar gaming streaming headphone, primarily for music production, primarily for music production, but also for gaming and streaming. Is that is that, uh, is that correct? Okay, six hundred dollars. How much is the Focal Alex? Is that that's seven hundred dollars? So that's out of the price range. Six hundred dollars. So for music production, it would probably be the Hi-Fi Man Sundara and an amplifier. Again, get a good amplifier for that. Um, I, I think, I mean, yeah, I know people are driving the Sundara with a hip deck, and technically it's got, you know, but it can probably get loud enough, but I think to get the most out of it, you'd want a full-size desktop setup um, with a big boy amp. Or get a get a micro black label. Those things are fantastic. Um, for mu- Yeah, for music production and, like, reference class sound, reference tuning, the... Yeah, the uh, Hi-Fi Man Sundara and an amplifier is is the way to go. Um, for gaming, though, I don't know if I'd pick the Sundara for gaming. I mean, it is good, totally fine. Like, and that's the reality is like a good headphone for music is also going to be a good headphone for gaming. But I tend to agree with Chrono that for best positional cues, dynamic driver headphones are probably a little better. Um, hmm. Does an EQ'd Harmonic Dyne Zeus count? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the default total balance of the Harmonic Dyne Zeus because uh, it's very bassy, very and like not in the sub bass but in the mid bass and upper bass. It's a bit yeah bloated there, but but the detail was good on that um, and the soundstage was good. 
So that's at least got something going for it. And it, I think it also depends on, this is for Josh, uh, it also depends on you know, if you uh, want to open back or close back. I think that's, that's an important consideration. If you can stretch your budget to $700, I'm going to say Focal Alex, because that is good for basically all of those categories. No, it doesn't have a big soundstage, but it does have good positional accuracy, and it's got very surgical precision for the imaging. Uh, and um, it's also got a reference kind of sound for music production. Um, so I think that would be that. Um, what else for gaming? You could look into some of the Bayers, but I don't know if I would use those for music production. I know people are going to recommend the DT1990 Pro. And I even, this is something I kind of have gone back on. I've changed my opinion about it. But the DT1990 Pro, I don't think is good for music production unless you're only using it for identifying flaws. So I think for music production, there's a little bit of this sort of like riding on the laurels of of what they've done already so far, like Bear Dynamic, like they're very well entrenched in that music production space. But I sure hope that they're not using those headphones for reference sound. <laughs> um, certainly not the DT1990, that is not a reference sound. Um, but if he thinks it is, I'm sorry, you're wrong. The DT1990 Pro is not a reference sound. It does not match what studio monitors in a proper room are going to sound like. Now, I'm not saying you, sh you shouldn't use it. I'm saying don't use it as your reference for what something is supposed to sound like. Use it for identifying where the flaws are in your track. Um, for that, yeah, I can totally see it. Um, T1 was more for production? Could be. Yeah, maybe. I know a lot of people who use the HD800 and HD800S actually for music production, which is interesting. Um, I wonder if that's more to do with like trying to recreate soundstage, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I think I think what you could do is you could look at like I'd want I'd almost want to say 600 ohm DT880, but I haven't tried that one yet. Um, but it would save you a lot of money if you can get away with that. <laughs> But otherwise, yeah, stretch your budget budget to seven hundred and get yourself a Focal Alex. Yeah, HD five sixty is fine, uh, fine for both, but it's like nowhere near as detailed as the uh, Alex or some of those higher end headphones. Um, are you thinking about getting a Flux amp? Um, yeah, I don't have any experience with those. Um, Focal sounds good at a certain tube amps. Just need low impedance. Exactly. Yeah. Just like Tyler said, like 32 is the max. <laughs> like that's the Kenzie is 32. Um, I will say the Focal open back. I've said this already on the stream, but the Focal open back headphones work great off of the Kenzie. Um, it's just the closed backs that have the issue because the closed backs already have that fairly pr pronounced uh, mid bass, and that's exactly where the impedance chain or the impedance relationship between the 32 ohm out on the Kenzie would affect the closed back headphones. So you'll boost the already boosted mid bass of those closed back headphones. So I don't recommend that for the Focal closed backs, but absolutely for the open backs, that's exactly what you want. It just adds a little bit of energy there in the bass, um, which is fine. Um, good old Celestial. <laughs> Metal's back. We did it, Metal. I don't know if you saw, but first try on the GL2000, we 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 almost nailed it for the uh, for the FR. <laughs> first try without even like having to you know keep uh, you know running lots of tests. Um, yeah, I actually wonder if I have the first try here. Is this my first try? Yeah, this was my first try. <laughs> almost nailed it. So I just I just fixed it a little bit in there. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I part of that's probably luck, though. Uh, I mean, just basing it off of like, I you do get better at it as you do more of it, and I, I've gotten to the point now where I can kind of make a general, like a guess at what the Q value should be and what the boost should be because I've been doing this for so long. Um, but even even after having done this for such a long time, like whenever I'm EQing headphones, like sometimes I'll boost something or cut something. I'm like, whoa, what? <laughs> this is not what I wanted it to do. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm uh, uh, pleasantly surprised that I got it very close on the first try. So, um, favorite closebacks in the one to three K range. Also your radio voice is fantastic. 
This is my old microphone and not the uh, RE RE20, which I will be using in all the live streams. It's just because I needed the uh, I needed the interface for the measurement rig. So, um, favorite close backs in the one to two, one to three K range. So, favorite close back around three thousand would be the Focal Stelia. I also think it's a little too like uh, mid bass forward. So, I actually prefer the the Celesti tuning. Um, so, Celesti would be a candidate there as well. Um, but yeah, Focal Stelia has, I even just have one here right now for comparison, and man, that thing is, that thing is detailed. Probably the most detailed close back, apart from the LCD XC. <laughs> and I really do think the LCD XC competes with the Focal Stelia, as far as technical performance, right? Like, the FR is still something that needs a bit of EQ, but for technical performance, like detail and all that stuff, it competes with the Stelia and it competes with the VC. The one, I guess, detriment there is that the v, the XC LCD XC is really heavy. Um, so I'll be getting my my sort of updated LCD XC with the carbon cups uh, in well back from, from I sent it, sent mine into Odyssey and they I think they're sending me the one with the carbon cups instead of the wood ones. Um, I'm gonna see if it sort of helps with the weight because that really is the only uh, downside with that. Uh, I mean, obviously you gotta EQ a little bit there and curb some of the crazy trouble, but. Uh, it has ear gain, so I was I was happy about that, <laughs> and it can take a lot of EQ as well. Not a lover, no, not a lot of love for Russian headphones. Kennerton, it's right, it's right there, it's right in the back there. Kennerton, oh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's the Kennerton Odin driver with the uh, Feck tuning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they actually really improved the comfort on that. Made it a lot lighter. Um, it's a very, it's a much more comfortable headphone than it used to be. Um, but it is that the Odin driver. Now, one of my, comp uh, you'll see, I'll be reviewing it, and it's an interesting headphone. Um, but I think they kind of, I don't know, they, they kind of screwed up a little bit because they, and this is a, it's LSA, so this is from um, uh, uh, Underwood Hi-Fi. Um, it's their own brand, I think. Um, but, uh, but it's a Kennerton, it's a Kennerton headphone. And, um, that one is, uh, yeah, the issue that I think, uh, exists with the, um, with that specific one is I think they over, they front, did some front damping on the, on the driver. Like it's just a piece of like felt over the front of it. And so it has that, the DCA effect of sounding just a little bit, uh, to borrow Crin's term blunted, um, but but just a little bit like not not like panda level or anything like that um and then it's interesting because like for the rest of the bass um it actually has really good bass texture and so it does kind of compete there with like the lcd2 and lcd x and stuff like that um but uh, you know the it's still a little bit over damp there i think that's and i wish manufacturers would stop doing that like stop front damping <laughs> uh it's just as yeah it, it leads to this sort of like um yeah, Crin's term blunted is the best description I can think of. Like, it's this sort of, like, you know, you're leaning forward because you're kind of thinking there should be, like, a more to the micro dynamic and micro detail and trailing end, but it's just just ever so slightly chopped off. I don't like that quality. Um, so let me just be clear on that, though. Like, it does have the technical performance to be competitive with some of those Odysseys. It doesn't have the grainy, hazy mids, right? But at the same time, it also has that somewhat blunted character there for you know the micro dynamics and micro detail just a tiny little bit and like with the dca effect yeah like the like the aeon 2 when you put the the, fil the little tuning filters in it's got that effect because they front damp the front damp in the driver which is a pain i would almost just like take it off and then eq <laughs> like you can you can take it off if you want to like like i'd it would probably void the warranty i don't you know recommend doing that if you want to you know deal with that but to make it sound better yeah i would do that and then just eq um, LSA HP1 equal Kennerton Thek, but it's the Kennerton Odin driver, and you can tell because all the screws are in the same spot as well. Um, Aeon 2 closed or is LCD XC or Stelia? Well, if you're never going to EQ anything, uh, Stelia, uh, then maybe XC, then Aeon 2. I, that's, that's a those are some different price categories there. Um, <laughs> listening for enjoyment. I don't even know what that is anymore. Are you talking about the Odyssey Euclid? Yeah, so the Odyssey Euclid, I hope to get one in soon, or at least a, I had a pre-production unit um, 
which measure differently. Um, but I'm not going to post that, obviously, because it's not representative. <laughs> um, but I need to get a, a production unit in. Um, so I've emailed those folks over there, and uh, hopefully they can uh, hook us up and I can give impressions because it, it is definitely um, technically very capable. Um, so it's the most, like, so my, my initial assessment is that while the FR is not great, it's it's still better than all the other planar IEMs that I've come across. <laughs> um and not just, I don't mean just from looking at it, I mean from listening to the pre-production one that I had. Um, and I and um, I think they did incorporate some of the feedback there for the base level. Um, but I don't think it was just for me. I think it was, you know, people were probably just telling them they needed to, you know, get a bit more base. And I think they did that. They did a good job there. Um, and uh, the technical performance is definitely up to the, up to the price tag, I think. Um, let's see. Okay, two more questions, guys. Two more. Top pick for mid fi around two fifty. Is two fifty mid fi? It feels like our prices have like shifted. Because <laughs> um, like you know now there's like ridiculously expensive headphones that are uh, in you know where does where does like flagship start? Is it at a thousand dollars or is thousand dollars mid fi? <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, two fifty. I'm still, if it's 250, I'm probably still going to get an HD 6XX and then just like EQ it with a good, with a good amplifier, you know, something like that. Can you really get an HE 560 for 269? That would be insane. I own both LCD X and 2C. Um, that's a tough. Oh yeah, he's, he's replying. I see. Get all these questions from Metal Five Seven One. I should just get him on the uh, on a live stream. <laughs> okay, one more question here. One more question. <laughs> yeah, I, sh I should start an OnlyCans. I should. <laughs> Char charge extra for you know little bits of chest hair. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not a fan of the A90. I I like as much as a, the ASR data is useful for those metrics. You don't want to index for measurements. I mean, this is something I've been talking with a number of people for, and, and I'm stealing the phrase from somebody, and he knows who he is. But if if you if you index only for what you can measure, you run the risk of missing the whole point of that in the first place. And I think they're doing that with ASR. Um, but that doesn't mean that I dislike or am like uh, you know against the measurements and what they're you know the data and like the data is great, and um, so if you care a lot about Synad, sure get the A90. But if you listen to the A90 and compare that to the Rebel amp or the or the IH6, it sounds terrible <laughs> or it sounds super dead. I don't terrible is the wrong word. It sounds it sounds fine, but you, it's it does not sound as um, yeah, it doesn't sound as dynamic or impactful as like an IJ6 or yeah, Rebel Amp or something like that. I mean, and in some ways, I mean, that's the thing. Like if you own an A90 and you're like, oh man, that sucks that he said that. Well, just know that you have something that is like super, like it measures really well and you're getting the, the, the transparency of all that stuff and you're not adding anything. That's great, but I don't know, for actual enjoyment... I would take the IHA six every time. Are you planning a new Jotunheim review? I know I said one more question, but I'm having fun. No, I I don't have I don't have one here. I would I would love to get one, but yeah. Well, I, I don't mind the data driven approach. I do stuff that's data driven, and I think so. Like think about it, right? Like everything to do with headphones and amps and sources and all this stuff. There is, if there is an acoustic effect there is a cause right and we can we can probably measure some of that right now if, even if we can measure all of it right now right what we're not doing is we're not we're not analyzing what we've measured in terms of its effects like subjectively experientially we're at we're right so like 
it's almost like we're, we're doing it backwards <laughs> right so the idea of like the subjectivist like there's some sort of magic in between you know there's we don't know what's causing it there's magic like no there is something there there is a fact of the matter thing headphone a is more detailed than headphone b right there, there's a reality to that right but and, and that's and I'm sure that that is something that shows up in data somewhere. But what we're not doing right now is is, is correlating that at all. Um, so that's sort of where the limit is, in my opinion. It's the limitation. <laughs> yeah, I'll get a signature in soon. I'm not into vinyl at all. Yeah, you have to be like volume matched in order for it to be like perfectly volume matched and like playing the same song at the same time and just like, <laughs> or get someone to help you with a blind test or something like that. Yeah, more thick sound. Yeah, this is, uh, I get what you're saying there. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about that that DAP question. I don't know the answer there. The current measurement set in amp world, and headphone world is lacking and complete. I actually think there is a good chance that it is complete as far as what metrics we're evaluating. And talking to objectivists who know, who, like talking to the more reasonable objectivists, um, they tend to agree that actually what we can measure is theoretically all there is, but what the reasonable objectivists also agree on um, to a certain extent is that there's at least the ones that I've talked to um, that there's also a whole bunch of ways that we're not analyzing the current set data sets you know the current metrics so and I'm of the opinion that yeah either they're incomplete or we're not analyzing them in the right ways or like you know we can analyze for tonal balance and frequency response like I'm just showing you here right we can analyze for this stuff and that's really just the relationship between fundamental and harmonic and, and ensuring that it, the sound is what is close to what the brain expects to hear. That's all we're doing as far as the analysis of frequency response goes. What we're not doing is looking at the frequency response for potential indicators of other qualities like, for example, detail, like dynamics, right? Dynamics is such a weird one because so much of that may also be contained within frequency response, but in all of these examples where something lacks dynamics but still measures great in the bass it's like well what how how do we explain that and one of the answers is potentially using these in-ear microphones that i've been using a little bit more to see if there's some unique coupling effect that occurs with certain types of headphones like for example the hi-fi man aria and ananda does the unique coupling factor for those headphones mean that they'll measure well in the basses and they have good like a, a boosted bass um, but because of the, you know, when you actually couple them to the side of the head, you know, you don't actually get the, the physical air pressure feeling. And then that's why you lose the sense of dynamics. I don't, I don't know if that's why, but, um, it, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not contained within frequency response. It just means that, you know, we're not evaluating frequency response in terms of those things. Oratory had a great post about if the FR was truly a exactly the same, the headphones should sound the same as long as there are no resonances. There's a lot of implications there in the small details. So here's been my thought on this, right? Like if we take this, so let me just get rid of this. So if you look at like the FR here, right? This is unsmoothed. I'll get rid of this. Let me, okay, I'll go back to, actually, no, I'll do this one. I'll go back to the original gold planer. This is the gold planer, right? So this, like all of this information here may, like this may contain something about the experience that we're not analyzing it in terms of because it's, it's impossible because we can't analyze this as easily in terms of what we want to for tonal balance and frequency response the way we can analyze this, right? It just makes cleaner and easier to read. That's the only reason for it. But maybe this tells us something, right? I'm not entirely sure. Um, and even talking with Jude about this, uh, he had some interesting stuff to say on this as well. And I'd be curious to pick his brain a little bit more on it. But 
well, perhaps on a more realistic head or a more realistic, uh, so for example, the BNK5128, uh, which is what is the rig that he uses, uh, perhaps this information, uh, you know, would tell us more about about these types of qualities like detail and whatever else, right? So, um, where I think we need to be very careful is is in terms of our analysis of all the additional metrics like CSD and whatnot, because I think it's easy to make mistakes there and read into it stuff that isn't actually true. And I'm certainly guilty of that in the past. I used to be, you know, a CSD believer, and then I had I, I had conversations with oratory and metaconist about this basically, <laughs> um, and and also did the research. I read up on. Um, there's a there's a book by Floyd Toole where Matt Economist actually was the one who took the excerpts. I didn't realize that until I talked with him about it. But um, and Chocomel as well was was talk was helping me out with that. Um, but yeah, in general, I mean, talking to those guys and reading reading those um, those chapters, it was very illuminating. Um, now I still think though that like with that stuff, there is potential that with certain types of headphones, we kind of stray a little bit from strict minimum phase rules. Um, for headphones like and maybe that does you know maybe planars are an example of that like what grover was talking about um i just don't know um so i kind of defer to you know the the more let's say reasonable learned objectivists on that um and not to lump myself in with the objectivist camp at all because I'm, I'm certainly not I'm much more of a subjectivist because what i'm doing is i'm reporting the experience which includes all the other stuff like detail and soundstage and whatever else Thankfully, I think we now have Sean Olive a little bit more on side with uh, <laughs> potentially, uh, you know, identifying additional qualities in headphones. I didn't realize, like, I I didn't realize that he wasn't against that. I, I, or I, yeah, yeah, I, I always thought that he just thought that FR was all there was um, and that tonal balance was all there was. But it was more that he just didn't have a concrete definition, which, I yeah, it's understandable. Um, I need to get Sean Olive on the on the as a guest. Um, no, Jude, I don't think I'll be having Jude on, but I would love to have more conversations with Jude. Um, like, and I get it. Like, I, I don't think, like, if I were in Jude's position, I wouldn't want to do anything like that either, because it like there is so much weird vitriol in this hobby that comes from places of purchase justification, whatever. Like, I, you don't want to invite that into your life if you don't have to. <laughs> um, Maybe we can do something pre-recorded with him. That I'd love to do that because conversations with Jude have been like some of the well, this la this conversation I had with him not long ago was one of the most illuminating and fascinating conversations I've ever had in this. And Metal can attest to this. He, <laughs> I'm sure he's had a similar conversation. It's like, oh my god, I know nothing. <laughs> um, but yeah, Sean, I'd love to have Sean on a, on the show. It'd be great. Uh, I think he. Plus, like, I, I don't know, Sean is one of the most fun people to have banter with on Twitter as well. So I think it would be a great conversation. <laughs> um, uh, Synad race? Oh, wait. Yeah, like, the, well, that's the thing. Like, I actually think the amp and DAC measurement stuff, like, Synad is, is interesting, but I don't think we should use it as like a buying guide. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I think at the very least you'd go there and go, okay, is it broken? Is it, is there something wrong <laughs> with it? No. Okay. Now I, I, now I need to go listen to it. Right. That's, that's more <laughs> how to approach that stuff. I don't think we should be only buying. I know, but people will do that. They'll be like, okay, what's the best ranking thing on the Synod? Oh, this one, this is the best ranking thing. And then they go and buy like a, a D90 or whatever's in their price range. Right. Um, so I, I don't know that's or an a90 or whatever and and like don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not uh, intentionally you know crapping on the a90 because if you want that kind of thing then that that's fine if you want something that measures well if that's what you care about and that's what you're doing then great <laughs> but I, I do think there's so much more to it than just uh you know synad um dude is jude is amazing to talk to i've had one of those calls with him awesome dude super into the research yeah exactly he's not what people think um not sure why it's so polarizing i think we should be careful of how we phrase things though it's really easy to get to make blanket statements good and bad exactly i i'm guilty of that as well 
people spend a lot of money on hi-fi equipment so they get very attached to their opinions yeah <laughs> um people start whole channels for purchase justification reasons and then yeah they get very attached to the gear that they own because they want their money to be well spent but that's not a subject i need to get into um but at some point it, it, i might do a video on sort of like the the biases that exist and sort of the framing effects and purchase justification that we're all guilty of i'm definitely guilty of that as well um No, I actually I, for D ninety I like that. That's the you're talking about the DAC, right? Not the not the amp. I thought the DAC was great. Um, I had no issue. I thought it was a very competitive product. The only thing issue with the D ninety was that the SU nine came out a little bit afterwards, was less expensive, and sounded at least as good. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, it's not a, like the D ninety I thought was a really great, a great sounding DAC and probably one of the one of my favorite of the AKMs, but. Um, I personally would probably take an SU9 over a D90. Just because, but that's like, I don't know, I like, I really like the ESS uh, DACs that have, that don't have the IMD issues. And this is again where ASR is very useful. Um, that You'll be able to identify intermodulation distortion issues that do, I like at least in every instance where I've listened to a DAC, an ESS DAC that's had that sort of glaring and grating quality, they've all had IMD humps. So, uh, when they don't have it, they sound great. <laughs> I think if you aren't here for the music, then what are you here for? These are just tools to get closer to what we as individuals want to hear, right? Yeah. Um, well, I, music and gaming or whatever else, right? Like whatever media that you're consuming. Yeah, I agree. Like um, a lot of this is like to try and this is what I like about Sean Olive actually and like what the research that they did was that they they didn't use the measurements as like a like a, a rule book for for you know you have to have you have to have something that measures good blah 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 right it was more about being able to predict what people what people would like so with that approach finding it's almost like sort of like the the, the backwards like I think people look at the frequency response stuff and go oh the target is the rule and the target isn't the rule the target is just predictive of what people would like because that's what people liked <laughs> I think that's kind of like it, it's, it's sort of the inverse of that right um, so and now people end up using it as a rule which I think is maybe not the right way to think about it um, because as Tyler says you know at the end of the day it's all about you know being able to enjoy your music better and I've even made a mistake on SBAF in the past, back when I was more into, when I was on that forum a lot, where, you know, I I was, I, I wrote some big post about how the issue with, um, the reason why, you know, headphone appreciation um, is not as widespread is because it's not a communal activity, whereas speakers is a little bit more accepted because you can show somebody very easily, you know, uh, the benefits of that and you can enjoy it communally um whereas yeah headphones are very much more private kind of solitary um thing but somebody i think correctly pointed out or corrected me on that and, and they said that uh it was back in my early reviewer days but they they said actually no uh, people are really just it's it's more about the music like we're we're music enth enthusiasts we're not headphone or speaker enthusiasts or gear enthusiasts we're music enthusiasts and and so ultimately like you know wanting to make our music sound good that should be like the the foundational bottom line <laughs> and then we can look at all this stuff to maybe make it get there right um i still think i'm right about the headphones being a more solitary activity but the idea about it being more about music enjoyment than specific types of equipment i think is an important thing to hold in view um Yeah. Anyways, I think that's probably going to do it for the stream, guys. Thanks for hanging out for two and a half hours. <laughs> um, once again, for the EQ profile that I ended up with here, uh, this is what I applied to this GL2000 to get it to measure well and sound way better. Um, I'll be posting this to the forum 
this this uh, preset to the forum. Keep in mind your negative 11 there. And um, yeah, uh, so if you guys want to look at this after the stream and you know do do the EQ yourself, if you guys have a GL2000 double sided, this does not apply to the single side. And I, sh I should also mention that it does not apply to the hybrid pads. This is only with the leather pads here. So yeah. Ah uh, man, people are getting into <laughs> people are getting into the EQ discussion to EQ or not EQ. I think if you want to take your music and sound quality seriously, you have to at least be willing to dabble in EQ. I'm not saying you know you need to do it, but you have to be willing to at least experiment and see because otherwise, how do you know what you like? Um, other than tr buying every headphone, which is a really expensive <laughs> hobby. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that's going to do it for the stream. Thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in. And thanks to everybody who you know uh, who was willing to help test out the Super Chat. Because uh, I think what we're going to do, again, for some of these live streams that we do, where we have lots of people, we will uh, we'll engage the Super Chat just to make it a little bit easier to identify questions. Because, I mean, right now it's okay, but sometimes it gets insane. So if you want your head, if you want your question to be answered, to if you're like, I really want this to be answered, use that um, otherwise there's a good yeah we could we could miss it um but yeah um i will see you guys in the forums and see you guys in future videos